Yusuf Arakat, aka FoozyTube, is an internet personality that has been around for the past decade or so. His career has had many, and I mean many, ups and downs throughout his time on the internet, and yet even over a decade after his start, he's still up to his same old antics, only on a much larger scale these days. Shout out to the channel members like always, and if you'd like to support yourself, you can check out my Patreon in the corner or YouTube memberships by clicking the join button. Just when you think his story can't get any more interesting, it does. So it's time to take a proper look into this guy and see what exactly is going on here. Now before we get into the current day, we must first take a blast into the past to see just how this guy got his start in life. Yusuf Aircat was born in Fremont, California on January 22nd, 1990. He is of Palestinian descent and was brought up in a religious Muslim family alongside his three older siblings by his mother and father. Not much is known about his early childhood, but what was known is that he was an inspiring actor, as Fousey would attend San Jose State University and majored in theater arts, in which he would get his degree in due time. It was around this time in college that he discovered a brand new website full of opportunity, and with nothing to lose, he took a chance and began what would become quite the successful venture. Fousey would get his start on YouTube on March 21st, 2011, uploading his first video to the channel just four days later on the 25th, which is basically an introduction to him and his personality while also parroting channel introduction videos that were typical during this time period. Greetings, YouTube. You don't know me, I don't know me, he doesn't know me, she doesn't know me, but trust me, you will know me. My name is Fousey Tube. Uh, you, 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 you can call me Fousey, you can call me Yusuf, you, you can call me Yusuf if you like, but as long as, like, watch my videos, uh, like my videos, and subscribe to my channel, and I promise you I'll bring you funny things. While the introduction is a bit dated these days, people took interest in it back then as it was full of much more character and confidence than the typical ones, and this confident attitude would be the catalyst for his early success. In fact, his very next video parodying Rebecca Black would be a hit, getting upwards of 200,000 views in just 6 months on the platform, which at the time was very impressive for a YouTuber, let alone it being someone's arguably first actual video on the channel. Fuzi would follow this up with two new videos for his fans, one being a video skit parodying the TV show American Idol, and another following up the Rebecca Black video, this time with the Jennifer Lopez song, getting even more views in a shorter time span than his last music parody. It was very clear by this point that Fousey had a knack for getting attention and views on the site, as his personality was entertaining and more eccentric than most people, and so his channel would grow quickly during this time. He already had a great foundation to build upon, and sensing a new avenue of content to try out, he would change things up a bit from that point onwards to see what could happen. On July 6, 2011, Fousey would release his video Middle Eastern Parents, a video satirizing Middle Eastern households and how they were growing up in. Mama, I just got into Harvard. Good, good. Mama, I just got into a car accident. Mama, enough is enough. You have to know something. I'm gay. You're what? You're gay? You're gay. Yes, the rest of the show, you gay. This new style of content would prove to be a very smart idea, as not only was it entertaining, it added relatability to the subject, getting upwards of 800,000 views in just three months quadrupling the output from his Rebecca Black video in just half the time. He would follow this up with more Middle Eastern related content the next few months on the site, as not only was it entertaining to any normal onlooker, he was appealing to a massive untouched audience that was seldom thought about in the entertainment sphere during this time. With this newfound fame, Fuzu would upload to the channel giving people some more insight on him personally. He would answer a variety of questions that people had for him, such as how he got his YouTube name among other things. And all you do is switch the Y and the F of my name. It's like magic. It's Fousey Tube, because this is my tube, and you're watching me through your tube. Hi, Tube. Question two. Do you get your eyebrows done? Question ten. How do you have the gay? He had mentioned that he was still in college during this time, and that his main goal with the channel was to change the world one smile at a time, and I really do not think that is impossible. Which, while a bit corny, was still something expected to hear from a bright and young college student majoring in theater. Fousey would branch out a bit with his content, as while he was still producing Middle Eastern comedy skits for his main fan base, he would also dip his toes into parodying figures in American pop culture, such as rapper Big Sean, actress and former TV host Ellen DeGeneres, and even Degrassi TV star turned rapper Drake. This would prove to be very successful as well, showing not only himself but everyone on YouTube that he wasn't just a one-trick pony when it came to entertaining the masses. He would continue to build off this success, releasing follow-up videos to what he has already, parodying other popular YouTube videos like the Epic Mealtime series, and even releasing a sequel to his Middle Eastern Parents video as well. Do you guys have the Lebanon? Uh, you know what, I don't work here, but I don't think they have that. They don't have that. Yes, they do. No, you guys have that. All these videos would gain him just under 35,000 subscribers by October 2011, showing that Fousey knew exactly what he was doing when it came to making content even in the early days of YouTube. 
That December, he would get about 20k more subscribers, and the very next month in January 2012, it would almost be double, meaning that he was finally starting to hit the big leagues. He would continue to make the usual content he was known for at the time and get plenty of views as expected, skyrocketing his fanbase to around 340,000 subscribers and 68 million total views on the channel by May 20th, 2013. It seemed that Fuzi was next in line to take over the YouTube game, and in fact, it was the very next day when he decided to jump into the genre he's most known for. On May 21st, 2013, Fuzi would upload his very first prank video, that being his hold my hand prank, in which he would go up to random strangers and, you guessed it, try to hold their hand. That's good, bro. It's a prank, 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 it's a prank. This new video would prove to be massively successful as well, getting upwards of 600,000 views in a little over a month, showing himself he found yet another avenue of content to produce. It was also around this time that Fuzi got his acting degree and moved to LA, and with this newfound motivation, he would follow that up with Gym Prank, That's My Machine Bro, in which he would troll people around the local gym. What? What? I'm playing too. What are you doing? This is my... What? This I'm playing, look. They call me Muhammad Jordan. This will get 900,000 views in a little over a month, showing Fuzi that this new avenue of prank content was the future, and so he would grab the bull by the horns and start to go all in on his channel. His next slew of uploads will mostly consist of prank content, with them outshadowing all other types of content on his channel. You got dropping people's phones prank, Ramadan drive through prank, eating people's food prank. Fuzi would even prank his own friend by setting him up thinking he was pranking another person and cheating GF prank gone wrong. Just stop it! Stop, it. Stop, you it. You it. stop! No! Dude! I, I swear it's what? a prank! This slew of prank videos would get him millions and millions of views, and by September 2013, he was already halfway to 1 million subscribers total on the channel. Mind you, this was just one of his channels, as he also had his personal channel Fuzi Fitness where he would post his workout related content sitting at a comfortable 40k, and Fuziville, his secondary channel where he would post daily vlogs about his life and other miscellaneous content for people to enjoy. As y'all have probably guessed, juggling these three channels was quite the workload for someone to have, and so he would give people an update on Fuzi Fitness about his current mindset after slacking off on the channel for a bit. A healthy hobby became an addicting obsession, and I asked myself, why am I doing this? Why? Like, I would be I would be at the gym all hours of the night, you know, and then I would just, it got to a point where I was on the treadmill warming up, and I asked myself, like, why are you doing this? What's the reason? What are you getting out of this? And I'm not talking about just being healthy. I'm talking about into the amount of time I was putting into this. It became a giant priority in my life to the point where I was working out so much at night I was able to wake up for my morning classes I was focused so much on you know what I was going to eat that day it would take up a large portion of my day because I was focusing on my meals rather than focusing on what I had to do on my agenda his ability to be open about his insecurities and personal issues back when it wasn't a normal thing for men to do was refreshing at the time, and add that alongside his general fun and likable personality on camera, it was stuff like this that had a lot of people coming back to his channel and secondary channels. Even with the gaps and uploads on FouseyTube, the videos were all doing very well, and FouseyVille would help fill in the extra space between recording prank videos. Just when he thought Fousey had peaked however, he would take things to yet another level nobody expected. On March 2nd, 2014, Fuzi would upload his yoga pants prank video, in which the man himself wears a pair of yoga pants to catch other men looking and embarrass them on camera. This particular prank video would skyrocket his career, getting a massive 18 million views in just 3 months after uploading. Given he had already a plethora of other pranks and skits uploaded to his channel, those would start to get a bunch of views as well during this snowball period, and within just a few months, Fuzi went from half a million subscribers to over 3 million and counting. Fuzi would start to go all out on his pranking videos, completely shifting away from any skits to pranking the unsuspecting citizens of Los Angeles to very successful results. He would stop uploading to Fuzi Fitness and drop the Fuziville vlog channel entirely and make a brand new one called Dose of Fuzi where it was basically his non-prank videos alongside the typical vlogging content for his now millions of fans to enjoy. His yoga pants prank video wasn't even the most successful during this period, as his Spider-Man in real life and Mortal Kombat pranks will blow everything else out of the water, getting upwards of 350 million views with just those three videos alone. Uh-oh, <laughs> reporting live from the Daily Bugle. Spider-Man, get him, get him, get him, get him, oh, get him, get him, 
By the end of 2014, Fousey went from under a million subscribers to just under 5 million, had a budding vlogging channel, and overall, life was looking very good for him. He was going on vacations to Brazil in his free time and showing off his brand new cars to all his vlogging subscribers, still posting his prank videos on the main channel, and overall just enjoying this massive newfound success on YouTube. Going into 2015 wasn't any different. He would keep uploading and people keep watching on both his channels, and the money kept stacking. Not only getting himself another Rolex, but also his very own TV show pilot now that Hollywood had their eyes on him. What up everybody, welcome to FoosyTube. My name is Yusuf, aka FoosyTube, and I spent the last 4 years taking YouTube by storm. Throughout the rest of the year, he would continue posting his prank and vlog videos, and even won the Audience Choice Award for Show of the Year at the Streamies in September 2015. He would thank his fans and family, and even his old college dean who said YouTube would be the worst decision for his acting career, which as we can see by now, was far from the truth. I want to thank God. I want to thank my theater arts major dean who told me making a YouTube channel was the worst mistake I'll ever make in my acting career. I want to thank the best family on YouTube, the DOF Brubras, my mom for buying me my first camera, and I want to dedicate this award to every kid out there who has mental illness. I have bipolar depression, and I was in rehab for an addiction, and it told me to stop every day, but I kept fighting, and it told me that I was worthless, but I never gave up, and here I am accepting this award. I love you. By all means, Fousey was peaking with no end in sight. His channel was now at over 7 million subscribers. His videos are getting millions upon millions of views a month. He was not only a household name on the internet, but also slowly making his way into acting. It's needless to say he was on top of the world and then some. Things weren't looking to slow down, but it was towards the end of the year where people started to notice something was off about him. As fall 2015 rolled by, Fuzi would start to talk more about his personal issues on his vlogging channel. Most notably, on November 24th, 2015, Fuzi would talk about how he's been overworking himself a bit and he needs to take a real break from YouTube for the time being. Um, I've been contemplating for a little bit now, um, taking a, a tiny, tiny, tiny break uh, from YouTube. And when I say break, I don't mean like, yo, I'm gone and I'm gonna go a couple months off or whatever. I just mean um, just a break for my, from, for my sanity for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, uh, maybe three weeks. This would hold true as he wouldn't come back until a month later on December 27th, uploading a whole 40 minute vlog of him hanging around with his childhood friends and family back in his hometown of Fremont. Oh, uh, I'm meeting up with all my childhood friends. Um, we're about to play. Why do I say it? Well, like, that's not even Ben. <laughs> it's not. We're about to play to football to on Christmas morning. So this is my childhood, guys. This is Fremont, California. As you can see, it's a much different. Not that one. Yeah, the the fight. <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> Why does Brandon come and drag Johnny on? Because you're getting your hand in the heat. This much needed break helped Fousey get back on his feet, as he would continue to upload his vlogs on Dosa Fousey and post on FouseyTube once again when 2016 rolled around, showing that maybe he just had a bad burnout spell, but he was ready to get back on his feet and make some money again. However, some people on the internet were starting to take a dislike to prank content during this time, as it became more and more known that most of the prank channels like Prank Invasion and Joy Salads were faking everything for easy money. While it's common knowledge today that almost all prank channels are faked, this was unheard of back in the day, and seeing a bunch of massive channels build their empires off of lies and deceit angered a lot of people. Fousey had somehow managed to stay out of these crosshairs, but when people saw this video of him calling out other people faking pranks in a very arrogant tone, they got interested in the man himself. Hey, Y'all can think that, I do fake ass pranks, and that's why I got that <laughs> you to you asses, cause I be doing that real shit, but these YouTubers that are out here making money, they're not gonna be making money because they're out here for the short term doing the fake pranks, getting that short money. But if you wanna do the long term money, you do the real pranks. Like that Epic money, Five TV. They would start to dig into Fousey and his videos, and what they found in hindsight wasn't all too surprising. Throughout the year of 2016, Fousey would upload a lot less frequently, but he was still pulling in great views on his main channel, such as taking advantage of the bottle flipping challenge that took the internet by storm during that time period. He would even start to work with buddy music star Ricegum during this time as well, culminating in a fake beef between the two for easy attention, views, and most importantly, that sweet, sweet YouTube ad revenue. Hey! I hate when people act nice to collab, but then I find out that it's
We shouldn't be okay with the negative stuff that are happening to people. We shouldn't be okay with seeing other people suffer. We shouldn't be okay with seeing people profit from other people's misfortune. Fousey even announced his very first big movie role, that being Tyler Perry's Boo, a Medea Halloween. Say what you want about the Medea movies, but the fact a YouTuber got himself into a popular and successful movie franchise proved that after conquering YouTube, Fousey was getting ready to conquer his biggest dream, Hollywood stardom. However, it was the beginning of 2016 where people started to really look into the man, and most importantly, by somebody named The Prank Reviewer. The Prank Reviewer got his fame on the site for breaking down prank videos and exposing people orchestrating them, including being one of the first people to expose Joey Salads back in the day. He had a healthy channel during this time period and was collaborating with other well-known YouTubers at the time like Grade A Underay, and overall, life was pretty good for the man. People would tell him to look into Fousey as he was one of many prank channels out there, and so he did along many others. However, it wasn't just the prank reviewer that had been on Fousey's tail, as back in late 2015, someone else tried to expose him during his time off. On December 4th, 2015, YouTuber Danny Duncan would be the first major figure to expose Fousey for faking his pranks, as he would go on to hire the same exact actor that he used for his Uber prank video just a few months prior. Uber! Ow! Uber! Ow! Uber! Whoa! Road trip! Let's this isn't the trying to go see my mom wish her happy 50th birthday, birthday. Yeah, and i'm trying to go to trader joe's man dude unless yeah, you want to go to the grocery, grocery store, store get the fuck out come on man let's go uber get out <laughs> all right that should be good <laughs> hey i'm shane barbera i was in fuzzy tubes uh uber prank um it's fake <laughs> didn't have an apartment didn't have a job so i was looking on craigslist for work uh, I found a Craigslist ad for like $30 to be in a video for like 30 minutes. Cool. They wanted a guy with a face and a car. And so I show up, uh, at this point I didn't know it was supposed to be like real, you know? I thought I was just gonna be in like a sketch or something. Um, and yeah, they're like, so yeah, we're shooting this prank. I'm like, okay, so it's not real? It's not a real prank? They're like, yeah, well it's supposed to be real. So like, yeah, he's gonna hop in your car and uh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, so we kind of like improvised it once. We kind of like did a run through of it, and then we did it a second time. It was really fast. I was in and out in like 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, that's awesome. Shane would go on to show further proof after the video uploaded, confirming this to be all 100% true and not a setup by a lookalike or anything like that at all. You can see it was posted on January 11th, three days after this conversation. All right, so back to the email. Hey, I'm up to help you guys out for 30 bucks. My number is blank. Attaches my headshot and even a picture of my car. Where are you filming? There's, but here you can see the gist of it. Hey, Shane, we'll be filming tomorrow at 4 p.m. at blank. Attire casual. There's a parking garage you can pull up into when you arrive. See you tomorrow, blank. Great, see you tomorrow. Um, and then this is when I got there. I said, I was in a hurry, so I said, got to shoot now or I got to leave. Um, and then... When I was leaving, I I, I, did, I didn't know who FouseyTube was at the time, so I asked, uh, what what channel is this going to be on? And he responded, FouseyTube. Despite solid proof and testimony of this, Danny's video would get a bunch of dislikes from Fousey fans trying to discredit everything as fake and for attention, and as of today, the video's been deleted off his channel. The reason why is still unclear, but either way, with hard evidence of Fousey faking one of his pranks, the prank reviewer decided to take aim at the biggest YouTube prankster on the planet. The next video people take a look at was the escape prisoner prank, the one where Fousey goes around terrorizing people for laughs and money. The main thing people took note of was right when Fousey punches a fake cop. Take a close look at it and see if you notice what's wrong. <laughs> While yes, the fake officer is obviously in on it and that's why the punch is fake, it's actually the clearly staged response from the two people walking that caught people's attention. The angle they're at gives them a clear line of sight that he doesn't even get close to hitting the guy, and some people took notice of the old man in particular, as for some reason he seemed a bit too familiar to them. The prank reviewer would end up collabing with YouTuber Is It Real on January 26, 2016, and in his investigation he would find out a very strange coincidence. This video took place in Los Angeles and the actor that comes out in that music video was in Los Angeles at that moment. If you look at the guy in the Fousey tube, prank the actor he has his hair is gray and he looks a little bit more aged and rightfully so it's been about two years after he filmed that music video that he appears on this prank 
it's the same guy. I mean, you can see very clearly. You can compare both of them there. The next video people would take a look at was the scary pizza delivery prank, in which one of the people's reactions just didn't seem right when watching the video again. Dude, I gave you my wallet. I didn't mean to sit right here for me. No, dude, sit right here for me. Come on, man, don't kill me, man. When googling the video you can find a link in the search results, but the uploading question has been taken down from the site. When going on the way back machine you can find a description explaining how the video went, but the video itself wasn't archived unfortunately. Luckily there's a clip laying around showing him admitting to being the actor in the video and that it's fake. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm an actor. I was in Fousey Tube's Scary Pizza Delivery Prank video. I was paid to act in it, and it's fake. Now, it doesn't take much here to see how bad this is. Pranking videos were all a rage in the early to mid-2010s, and Fousey was leading the pack when it came to it. When others were getting exposed for faking their videos, Fousey was over here bragging about how he doesn't make fake pranks because it's short money, yet these three pieces of evidence will come out and completely flip everything on its head. There's faking pranks, there's lying about faking pranks, and then there's arrogantly bragging in line about how you don't do that, while actually doing exactly that yourself the entire time behind the scenes. The main issue going on here is that Fousey built his entire empire off of lies just like most pranksters on YouTube, only he was at the very top. Nobody really needs to explain why lying to people is bad, and when people found out he'd been lying early on in his pranking career, they started to question everything he posted. Add that alongside the massive fame and wealth he managed to accumulate in just these three short years, and the public would start to slowly shift on the man. Fuzi would even make his first mention of his pranks being supposedly fake on Dose of Fuzi when ranting about how Muslim pranks are stereotypical and rude in a video posted on June 14th, 2016. It was the fakest reactions I've ever seen in my entire life. And yes guys, but Fuzi, you fake shit. How are you gonna talk about fake shit? Exactly. If anybody knows about fake shit, it's me. I know every video that's fake, it's obvious, I'm in the community, I know everybody who fakes shit, I know exactly how it is. It seemed that he was well aware of the slowly growing controversy against him, but given his first major movie was planned to come out soon, he had too much to lose and so would try to wait it out until the noise simmered down. The crowd would keep rising however, as not getting any answers from him was starting to frustrate him, and so they would aim their sights at the much more controversial side of his content. Throughout Fousey's time making the prank videos, his second most popular form of content were his social experiments, where he would put himself in certain situations to test the people around him and make a lesson out of it. The reason we took so long to get into them is because they go further than just faking things, but you'll understand soon enough. One of the most famous ones was the change the way you think social experiment, where he records a bunch of situations of people stepping in to help stop someone being chased or something similar. Get him! Get him! They might have noticed the video has been re-uploaded, now it's because it was taken down, with some people speculating it might have been because of the tone deaf ending. Or maybe it was because the prank reviewer found out that the very first guy was yet another actor that Fousey hired to make this video for easy views and money. So you see this guy right here? His name is Jeff Hull, and he is in fact an actor. I know that because that's what it says on his IMDB page. But prank reviewer, how do you know it's him? It may just be someone who looks very similar to him. Well, I found his website and within his website is his resume. And let's take a little look at what it says on his resume. Under the new media section, it has the video change the way you think. That's FouseyTube's video. As you can see, Fousey took a situation that could happen in real life and encouraged people to step in in the name of victims of violence, but fails to disclose that this was a fake setup and emphasize that most of the time this is a very bad idea to do. The assailant could have a weapon or be much stronger than you, and suddenly you'll end up in a bad spot and potentially get hurt or worse. Mind you, there are people out here who would take this video's message seriously not realizing that it's all fake, and they could end up in a bad situation because of it. Seeing that Fousey was willing to skew a narrative with actors and fake scenarios that fit his goal of selling a false message was very interesting to see, as it showed he was not only willing to fake his own pranks, but willing to fake his social experiments, which if you ask me, has a lot more repercussions than a simple prank. It's not just a video encouraging people to put themselves in a potentially dangerous situation, as Fuzu would make more fake social experiments, such as one where he pretends to be homeless and give people money to bad results. I just want to be a helping hand today. God bless. What? God bless, I'm just trying to help out. I don't need your money, you asshole. I can buy you. Man, I wish I could help you out, bro. I got uh, some water or something. How about I help you out today? Looks like you need it, so. Give me money, man. Yeah. You prick. As you can tell, the acting is pretty bad and it's easy to see that, especially with the first guy doing a typical fake anger approach. 
There's even one part where he forgot to edit one of the actor's faces out of the video. And given the circumstances of portraying him as a rude and careless person to millions on the internet, that would be putting him in a situation where people try to find his real identity and damage his reputation. This video also ends with a positive message and piano music telling people to share, and those that didn't know this was fake well did that thinking they were doing something good, when in reality Fuzi was just playing them again. These videos all have this positive message on a surface level, but when knowing they're fake you see how he tries to spin things to fit his narrative, always setting it under a basic message that you can't disagree with otherwise you'll be seen as a bad person. For example, the next social experiment featuring YouTuber Roman Atwood has him pretending to go end it all while the actor they hire gets them to stop to sell another false message to his viewers. The message itself is good at a first glance, but selling it by setting up a false scenario and preying on people's emotions with piano music is extremely disingenuous, and now knowing he fakes these videos, it's also in really poor taste. Fuzi didn't care if he felt empowered or changed by this video or not, he only cared about getting as many views as possible, masquerading it under the guise of sending a good message, when in reality he just wants people to spread the video as fast as they can and maximize his profits. This wasn't even his worst social experiment, as that one goes to this one right here, where he sets up a fake scenario full of actors who either go into the bathroom or walk away to fit his message. It gets worse though, as throughout the video he has a supposedly real survivor giving their message about when it happened to them. Now let's think about that real quick. If that story is fake, that means he used a fake story and fake scenarios to send a message about a serious subject matter for easy views and money, or if it's a real survivor with their real story, he's trivializing it by setting up fake scenarios and using her and her experience for easy views and money. Either option is despicable, and this is one of the prime examples of how far Fuzi was willing to take it for any type of views, money, and subscribers. Not a lot of people seem to catch onto his social experiments being fake alongside most of his pranks back in the day, so breaking down a few is necessary to really understand just how far he was willing to go to make a quick buck. Fuzi's main goal was money first and foremost, otherwise why would he set up all these fake pranks and fake social experiments unless he actually wants to test people out and send a message to them? He would choose situations that people can't disagree with on a surface level, otherwise they'll be labeled a bad person or just a hater, even if they know something weird was going on when watching the video. It's a really sneaky way of getting views and attention on the internet while also avoiding valid criticism, but now that people knew he was faking not only his pranks but the social experiments, they were out to expose him to anyone that would listen. We saw how Fuzi and Ricegum set up a fake beef in June and July of 2016, and one part of that beef included a diss track that Fuzi released on June 19th as those of the rage back in the day. The theme of the song was Roasting Yourself, and Fuzi would drop a few lines referencing this current controversy. They say my pranks are fake, well it's time to make amends. My pranks are stupid fake, here you want 30 bucks? I go from skinny to fat like every other month. The song was clearly made to acknowledge the haters are also running with the joke. And while this normally works with smaller situations, people saw right through this and were still rallying against him as nobody likes a liar and a cheater. That video where he and Ricegum came out about faking beef would drop on July 12th, of course. But this actually wasn't the last time Fuzi would acknowledge faking videos. On July 13th, the very next day, Fuzi would drop a now deleted video going over everything about his pranks and other pieces of content on his channel. The archive has a bio that is atypical from his usual ones, and while it won't fully open due to the way it was archived online, we can get an idea of his current mindset and mental state when making the video. Clearly the pressure got to him and he finally cracked and decided to come up about everything as his reputation was slowly being ruined with every passing day, and the video itself is over 40 minutes long, meaning he must have a lot to say. Fuzi starts the video bashing on drama channels and trying to say that they try to end people's careers, clearly trying to spin the situation as them being the bad people in this case. After my video was posted, naturally, drama channels weren't happy. I mean, how could they be? This directly affected their business. They unintentionally send loads of hate and the possibility to hurt some people's lives and to end some people's careers on a daily basis. He would go on a rant about the drama channels some more and how they spread hate and negativity instead of positivity, mentioning that he doesn't care if people expose him for faking pranks, and generally just continues to rant about his dislike for drama channels, such as the Drama Alert channel specific and its host Keemstar. I'm not mad at that. Go ahead, expose all my videos. I don't care, that doesn't affect me. What do your videos do? They use us in the title, they use us in the thumbnails, and they literally have you playing CSGO as you talk about us. So your content is curated by us. 
So as a person who works really hard and has grinded for five years to get to where I'm at, to have somebody like you use my name in your title and your thumbnail, to have you play CSGO and talk about drama that happens in my life and make money off it, I don't think that's cool. So for me to talk about him to the best family on YouTube, because I know you call them the worst family on YouTube. Greatest family on YouTube, more like the fakest family on YouTube. He would finally get into the prank stuff a little over halfway through the video, in which he says he admitted to faking pranks before and uses the self diss track in his example of that. And by the way, the fake pranks, I've already admitted to faking pranks. I've already posted a roast yourself challenge where in the challenge I say, My pranks are stupid fake. Here you want 30 bucks? I go from skinny to fat like every other month. That has no weight to hurt me. Why? Because the fake pranks don't hurt anybody. The 99% of fake pranks on YouTube have not hurt people. He then tries to say that because the fake pranks haven't hurt people, that it shouldn't matter that much. And then tries to compare his fake content to reality TV shows. Is it really that bad? Oh, but you're frauding your audience. Wake up, Keem. Look at reality TV. Do you think any reality show on TV is real? Are you gonna tell me the Kardashians are real right now? Is that really what you're gonna try to tell me? Look, my favorite show was Nathan For You on Comedy Central. What does he do? He goes to stores and he says he can help them out and he revamps their business module. He plays the show as 100% real. It's my favorite show on TV. I was watching an episode, bam. One of my actor friends appears on TV. And in the show, my actor friend was married and had a baby. I immediately knew the show was fake. Did that affect me? Was I mad? No, because that show brought me so much happiness, it didn't hurt me in the slightest. Fousey would then rant about how drama channels other people reason view fake pranks in a bad light now, saying that he personally believes it doesn't matter, and more general ranting about his fake pranks on a channel, how it doesn't hurt people, so why should it be considered bad? It's like become the worst thing that you can possibly do. But at the end of the day, I'm smiling when I say this, I do not think it is. Now, some of my viewers might be upset by this, but I really don't. And the reason I never talk about fake pranks is not to save my own face. It's to save a lot of people that I know on YouTube. But yeah, there were times where we did doctor a reaction and I'm admitting to that. And to any of my audience who might be hurt by that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can come to me in my face and tell me that I hurt you by doing that and I'm sorry. The reason I did it, it's entertainment. I tried making you smile, I tried making you laugh. I'm not the douchebag that I portray myself out to be. I've done some crazy stuff in my pranks. I would never do that in real life. That's why whenever I got hate for a prank that I did, I laughed, because I knew that I would never do something that crazy. All magic is fake. All magic is still love. Wrestling is fake. Wrestling is still love. Why? Because it's entertaining and it leaves you with something. He then goes on to admit to not only faking his pranks, but also his social experiments, naming off a small handful of ones that he faked for his channel. Faking social experiments is 100% wrong. 100% wrong. Have I ever faked a reaction in a social experiment? Yes, I have. And I'm here to talk to you about it and to tell you why I did it. See, there's a difference between my experiments and a lot of the experiments on YouTube. My experiments are not trying to push an agenda. They're not trying to vilify a certain group or a certain, you know, type of people. My experiments are trying to push a message. He then says he personally doesn't find faking his videos wrong under the guise of sending people a message, when in reality it's because he doesn't want to admit fault and instead tries to hide it behind a lie. Are there wrongs in those social experiments? Personally, I'm gonna say no. Fousey would continue to try to justify faking his social experiments under the guise of sparking a conversation and sending people a message, trying to set himself up as some sort of savior figure of sorts. So why was I doing that video? To spark that conversation, to show people why it's not okay. He would then talk about other people making fake social experiments after seeing him get successful doing it, and then go on to denounce them only now after admitting they're fake on camera because those other people ruined them entirely. But nobody put it on such a grand of a scale that I did. At the time that I did it, I told my friend who was recording for me that in two years, they were gonna be oversaturated on YouTube and people were gonna use the hell out of them for views. And what happened? The genre got destroyed. The reason that's bad is because you're pushing an agenda. You're making people believe a certain thing happened when it didn't. And you shouldn't do that. There is not one thing that I can't search on YouTube that hasn't been turned into a social experiment, no matter how absurd it is. And you know what? They get views. And that doesn't mean it's okay. And I will right here, sit here and say, I'm not okay with social experiments. I'm 100% against them. And that's why you will not see me do them anymore. And that's why you will see me 
call out anybody who does a fake social experiment now and tell everybody that it's wrong. The rest of the video is him talking about how people feel inspired and happy in watching his channel versus spreading negativity around when watching drama channels as it finally ends off. I love you so much. I appreciate you. Let's make YouTube positive again, and let's learn to love ourselves and love others. As y'all saw from the snippets, there's a lot of deflection and hypocrisy going on here. Like how Fousey says faking social experiments is wrong, but then say none of his own work. It was clear that his approach here was to constantly hinge on how his videos bring positivity to the world and drama channels don't. But it was obvious he was actually mad because big channels were reporting on him faking his content and it was spreading around like wildfire. Maybe that's why the video has been deleted off of YouTube since then? But who knows at this point because this dude has deleted a lot of content in general as you've noticed by now. Now after people had him admitting he was faking his pranks and social experiments and pretty much built his entire career off of lies, they would go full force against the man because despite his desperate attempts to frame his detractors as people promoting negativity, people don't really like it when someone fakes their way to the top. It also didn't help that he was filing false copyright strikes against a bunch of people like Scares, Chaos X, Silencer, and even those re-uploading the fake fight between him and Ricegum literally the very moment the stuff was going down. And as expected, Keemstar and many others would report on this news as it seemed Fousey was starting to go a bit crazy online. Keem even responded to Fousey the next day after he kept talking about him in that video we went over, and here's what he had to say. And now, because this drama is about me, I would like to share my opinion. FouseyTube. FouseyTube is the fakest piece of shit in this whole goddamn industry. He has called drama channels out for ruining careers. FouseyTube has ruined a whole f genre. By this point in time, Fousey was public enemy number one. He got exposed for faking his pranks and social experiments. Then he didn't take accountability and tried to pin the blame on drama channels. And finally, trying to mess up people's income by false striking those critical against him. August would roll by and people continue to trash on him some more, and it would only get worse for him from there on out. On September 22nd, YouTuber Colossal is crazy will upload FouseyTube, an alternate reality, where he goes through a handful of his fake pranks and breaks them down piece by piece to give people a better understanding of his scummy nature in his humorous fashion. I'm just wondering if he's implemented this as part of a sponsorship deal. Fuzi would respond by falsely claiming the video in question, Colossal would send a counterclaim and wait 30 days, and on the very last day, Fuzi would get the video straight up taken down, basically denying Colossal a whole month's worth of money because he was butthurt about the video. Things would eventually subside by early November, but this was still a very bad look for the man. As far as his channel was doing, around this time he would upload two videos featuring comedian Kevin Hart between September 28th and October 1st, which was mainly just the two of them hanging around as it became clear Fousey was making successful small steps in his attempts at Hollywood stardom. <laughs> Dose of Fousey was looking alright too as he would upload a video on October 19th walking his mom down the red carpet at the premiere of the Medea movie in Hollywood. However, after the release of that video, he would go completely quiet on the internet, with most people assuming that justified criticism was starting to get to him and was trying to run away from everything now that more and more people were learning of his scummy nature. Fousey would come back from his hiatus a few months later on April 16th, 2017, with a video about how not to treat someone with depression. It was yet another one of his corny videos, at least this time with the obvious sign that it was a skit and not any faint prank or social experiment or anything like that. He would continue to upload on the channel as he got back into the groove of everything, but he was noticeably getting much smaller views than usual, with some not even hitting the 1 million mark even to this very day. This was very unusual for him and his channel as he was normally getting a million views within a few days on it, and this adjustment period would be something for him to get used to. However, with the help of another viral video by helping out a navy vet that didn't seem fake, he would actually get to the coveted 10 million subscriber mark on June 3rd, 2017, being part of only a small handful of those on the site to reach that achievement. Today, you know, I told you I quit YouTube earlier this year. You were so scared what I'm gonna do. I came back, oh hello, like right now this second. 10 million, the biggest plaque. <laughs> Despite hitting this major milestone, his channel wasn't doing the best after this time period. He was still getting great views, mind you, but nothing close to what he was used to, and on top of that, his ad revenue was severely hit during this period in time due to a multitude of unknown factors. My channel was like not getting the revenue that it once was, and yeah. I was like, whoa, what is going on here? Like that day that it started going bad, there was a bug in the system and everybody had dropped that day. Okay. But it had stayed on my channel for a while because I checked my AdSense. Yeah. And 
sometimes the two million views with ridiculous watch time yeah. was paying me four hundred and fifty seven dollars. Now other friends channels before I even saw it, I said, hey, if you got one million views in 24 hours with this much watch time, how much are you getting paid? Yeah. The answer was between eight thousand and twelve thousand dollars. Wow. I was like, BS, I don't believe you. They pulled out their AdSense, showed me between eight thousand and twelve thousand dollars per day per video. The most frustrating time because all YouTube kept giving me back was, we're sorry. We don't know a solution at this point. We don't know what's wrong. We're looking into it. This would demotivate Fuzi as well. He had all the money in the world by this point in time in his life. When your peers are making a hundred times more than you making similar content, you're bound to feel some kind of way. In fact, this seemed to be a leading factor in him taking yet another break from YouTube as he would only upload a small handful of videos after that interview before taking a hiatus once again in July 2017 after the death of his dog Dollar. Well, it turns out this wasn't exactly a hiatus this time, as he would instead shift his focus on his brand new family channel, The Cat's Family, mainly consisting of Fousey showing off a bunch of expensive stuff he bought and posting daily vlogs with his family at his brand new mansion. It was clear he made this channel as a way to circumvent YouTube messing with his money, and while I can't necessarily blame the man, the content itself was rather tame. It wasn't the usual controversial stuff that he would post, but for all intents and purposes the channel was doing fine, as he was still keeping in touch with his core audience while also staying away from the most of the internet spotlight, and all things considered, he was doing better for himself. He even found a brand new hobby, going to the gym and learning how to properly fight people by boxing. Of course however, drama reared its head around the corner as expected, because for some reason he just can't seem to stay out of it. Back in fall 2016, Vitaly's TV made a video exposing Fousey before deleting it within a couple hours. Fousey you're the biggest b on YouTube. You're a crybaby. You had guts to say that 99% pranks are fake. Yeah, because 1% real is me. You're the fake one. A to the Z. Even your vlogs are fake. We went to Brazil. I tried to vlog you like, Vitaly, put the camera down. We're going to get killed. I went out with girls every night and friends partying. What did you do? You sat in your room jerking off. I asked you why, because you said it's too dangerous. And you know what? Don't make me expose your addiction. Keep your mouth shut. Well, not exactly full of anything groundbreaking or new, Fousey would respond around two years later on March 1st, 2018 on the Cat's Family channel, in which he makes his own claims against the man. I know you probably have an appointment later to bend over your kitchen counter while your friend injects steroids up your ass. So I'm gonna make this short and sweet. Yes, I'm gonna call you out to a boxing match. But before I do that, I'm gonna let the world know why this matters so much to me. You tell everybody that I was scared of Brazil. I was scared to have you vlog. I was nervous. You didn't talk about you assaulting women in Brazil. You didn't talk about me protecting you in your career. You didn't talk about me keeping my mouth shut, being a good friend to not hurt you. Keemstar would get the two onto drama alert on March 4th and interview them back to back. And truth be told, nothing interesting went down other than name calling and interrupting each other. Yo, but you are literally making up spewing shit out of I your ma ass. I'm making up stuff that you, everything you, making up stuff that you used to do. Did not forget. I remembered the night exactly. I remembered the night exactly. Yeah, the girl knocked on his door. Blah, blah. I just told her she can't leave the apartment because she took my Rolex. And I was like, you know, no, no, no. Girl. See, you just got the stories mixed up. The night of the Rolex was the orgy night. It was not the night of the first girl. You just called yourself. Hey, long, hey, long. He says you were so hungry and thirsty for a prostitute one night. He paid you and he's translated in Portuguese to her what to say. You took her home. That next night you texted him and said, I owe you money, Papa. And he says till this day, he never got that money from you. Oh he yeah, had, like, like you brought it up. And first of all, I'd rather fake pranks than fake my religion, okay? And seem like a good Muslim that you are, that you're not. You're just a pure devil inside. You lied your whole career. You abused hookers, drugs, and alcohol, and you won't come out and say. I have to evaluate that and see if that's what I want to do. And yeah, but Fousey, you can't, Fousey, you can't, no, you can't listen back out gonna, now. Listen how I'm going to- He's going to have a mental breakdown. Both Fousey and Vitaly made a bunch of allegations against each other with no proof. And as the video ended, it came off as a waste of time and nothing more than bickering from two former friends that don't like each other anymore. Nothing would really come of this, though it's worth pointing out Fousey uploaded his last Cats Family video on March 20th, 2018, just two weeks after this drama with his channel being dead ever since, so who knows what went down there. 2018 was looking to be a good year for Fousey. Sure, the situation with Vitaly might have hampered the mood a bit, but his family channel was doing well for a moment and his new boxing hobby was helping him stay active and keep his mind off the internet and those rooting on his downfall. He even entered a rehab facility just a month later in April to try and fix himself up as he was struggling a bit with his mental health issues. While nobody was expecting any kind of massive comeback for him, they were at the very least expecting him to stay out of trouble and out of the limelight for a bit longer as he enjoyed his life for a moment. 
Given how things have gone, however, this couldn't be further from the truth. Because as we've seen already, Fousey has a knack for always ending up in a negative media spotlight in one way or another. In July 2018, Fousey started to promote this brand new event he set up called Hate Dies Love Arrives, with plans for it to take place at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. It was being branded as an event to spread positivity and love around, and most importantly, was completely free for the public. Fousey was spending the entirety of July posting video after video promoting it for people, tagging a bunch of celebrities on his Twitter page alongside a story about how he was manifesting the event to feature a bunch of famous people and rappers from Hollywood, tagging even more celebrities saying that the message was sent and that they'll feel it soon, basically going on about some really strange and off-kiltered stuff. He even hit up some people outside of music and general acting, such as making a video trying to convince boxing superstar Floyd Mayweather to show up. Floyd, just like you stepped in the ring and show everybody how strong you are, I'm trying to show the universe how strong I am, and I need you. I would love for you to contact me, Floyd. Let's go. Greatest of all time. Let's do it. One of the people Fousey was heavily promoting to come to this event was none other than Drake, the rapper he heavily parodied years ago. In fact, he was basically the main man he was pushing to come to the event, making post after post that heavily implied he was going to show up, and even posting a handful of rather interesting videos as well. Yo, Drake. I literally look like a crazy person right now because I'm outside of the place that you're at. Don't ask me how I found it, bruh. God put me here. I'm on God's plan right now. I'm walking in God's purpose. My stars aligned. I never thought I'd be at the place literally where Drake is right now, where your dad is, who I know personally. I wasn't scared to send him a message to say, I want to speak to you, man. I have a message. I'm on a mission. I just need 30 seconds of your time and I promise you'll understand. July 15th is going to change the world. I promise to have more eyes on this event than the president does on our country. And I need your energy, energy for that to happen. Excuse me. That's how you know Drake's in L.A. Hey, Drake, OVO. Yo, I'm trying to look like you, dog. Is it working? No, nah, I'm not. But some girls do call me Champagne Poppy. Some girls do call me Habibi. I got a girlfriend, though, so it don't matter. Sorry, ladies. The king is back. Anyways, Drake, I'm trying to find you because I want to invite you to my July 15th show tomorrow, free at the Greek Theater. It's a concert to celebrate love after the World Cup. I need your energy, Drake. This is energy. Energy. Got a lot of energy. Got a lot of people trying to jam me in this energy. Trying to take away from an Arab. Hey, get back in the car. Whoa. Get back in the car. Okay, sorry. Yeah, his obsession with Drake was hitting an all-time high, as Fousey was dedicating a lot of this event on him specifically pulling through for the fans. He would even hop on an Adam22 interview on the No Jumper podcast on July 12th just three days prior hyping it up some more and asking even more celebrities to come and join his mission. DJ Khaled, as your Palestinian brother, your Arab brother, I need you to DJ this event. I got all your brothers coming from New York. All of them. Hit them up. They're coming. Will Smith, we need you. Jaden Smith, we need you on stage to perform Icon. Drake, I heard you're in LA this weekend. You just dropped the summer's anthem. Mm. We need you. For the people. Meek Mill, we need you. He's in jail. Huh? But there's one king the city of LA needs right now, and that's LeBron James. Mm. LeBron James, I need you to get on that stage July, like literally, look, bruh, I was literally in Australia a couple of days ago, and now I'm here giving messages to LeBron James. I would look like an idiot if I didn't believe that he's going to be watching this. He's That's the energy watching. we got to be on. LeBron James, you need to come July 15th. The city loves you. Put on the crown. Get on that stage. And let's change the frequency. F hate. Spread love. Hate dies. Love arrives. July 15th. A free concert for the city and the world. I love you guys. I gotta go finish this. Bro, we just changed the world. Let's go. As you can probably tell, Fousey seemed a lot more unhinged than usual, as while he was known for being an eccentric person in general, this was getting to levels nobody had seen before. Constantly tagging celebrities on Twitter, talking about this message and this manifestation of a successful event, worshipping and basically stalking Drake this past week, it was safe to say something was afoot here. While some people really liked the overall vision and goals he had, others are skeptical given the sketchiness of how things are unfolding, and others are just straight up doubting him entirely as he's a no liar and fraud and saw this as yet another attempt at getting attention towards himself. 
one of those people included Keemstar, as he was carefully watching everything unfold throughout the internet behind the scenes. Seeing this as an opportunity to document a big story on the internet, he would consult with a handful of other LA-centric YouTubers such as Shane Dawson, FaZe Banks, and even Ricegum, Fousey's former collaborator from two years ago. They would talk between each other about seeing Fousey acting up on the internet and that something felt really off before getting into a one-on-one -on -one call with him that very moment. My intention out of this, and I know this is gonna sound crazy, I wanna make $100 million in, the, like, in my lifetime, right? In a couple of years. I wanna take that $100 million turn it into a foundation and that money to be able to be used by people in the world in real life circumstances, whether it's, and I know this sounds crazy, I'm trying to think that big though. While Keemstar is a bit more focused on getting the finer details down with Fousey about how things are going to go down and what could go wrong, FaZe Banks was warning him about what was going on as he had been through a similar mental state like him before. A lot of the shit you're saying right now is actually shaking me the f*** up because it's it's like crazy how similar it was to like, I don't know if you remember like when I had a meltdown on like social media. I wasn't telling myself I was manic, but I definitely knew I was crazy. But I felt like the wave I was on was the right wave and it felt good to me. It turned out to like just ultimately ruin my life for like a good year. And I needed that. I spent two weeks in a mental hospital because of the shit I was doing. Fousey would then say he was planning to drop a music video at the event. So Keemstar would obviously question what it was about as the call hangs up and everyone discusses what exactly is going on with him right now. When did you make the song? When I was in Australia. He just told me that he made a music it video. Be, it, 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 Slow it down. We're not talking about someone who's all there right now, okay? He's going through a manic episode. One trillion percent. I don't know if that's true. One bajillion percent. This is how he's doing, this is a business thing no, for his fucking a vid He's dropping a video about like hate, whatever. No, did you just him. hear him? The song audio would be leaked early the very next morning and it would turn out it was a diss track aimed at Ricegum. That very person he faked drama with just two years ago and seemed to be on good terms with. Hey Brian. <laughs> Rice ain't got no spirit. Got no deeper layer. What? Yeah, that's what this is all about apparently. This track on you. Dude, I'm confused because I thought he was hyping up a positivity stuff. So. Dude, he texted me saying come to the event, so I'm just confused. Why is it about me? Well you go talk to him. So why do you think he's doing a diss track on you? Cause he's irrelevant, dude. That's <laughs> why. Soon enough, Keemstar and his crew would head to the Greek theater alongside the rest of Fousey's fans to see just how this event will go, and most importantly, if Drake and the multiple other artists and celebrities will show up and make this a success, or if it would fall flat on its face and embarrass Fousey on a scale never seen before. The event was looking to be extremely empty while interesting, albeit in the wrong way, especially after hyping it up so much and being free for anybody to come by and hang around. This was way more dead than people were expecting, and while it was still the afternoon and hot outside given it was in the middle of summer, the massive rows of empty seats was not something people expected when entering. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out something was going wrong here right from the get-go, but at least it wasn't completely dead, so things weren't a complete failure just yet. Keemstar and his crew would end up getting there and chatting with a few people outside the venue about what was going on for a minute and their opinions and such, and then would head into the VIP section with a bunch of other influencers who had made their way to the event. While chatting with a couple people in the VIP lounge, they all had their own opinion when hanging around that gave a little context as to why things seemed off right from the start. For the first performance, it was supposed to start at 6, but then because people were allowed to come in at 4.30, he wanted to get smaller acts in there yeah. now. But oh, okay. Yeah, like the audience. Like, yeah. right now, it seems like there's... They need, they need to show this side. Of, of there's a lot of open chairs. <laughs> yeah. Legitimately. Yeah, there's, there's about 10% of the stadium is filled, if that, right now. This made a lot of sense. As an event starting earlier than planned and seeming empty is normal as most people aren't there yet, so while it wasn't the best look so far, it added some clarity and gave people an understandable reason as to why things look so bad. All the people, both influencers and fans, were simply waiting for the real show to start, and during this pre-show phase, if you will, a handful of them would go onto the stage and announce their presence and thanking them for showing up. Ah, uh, let's do it big. Let's do it for the community. Let's do it for love.
Kate came back into our lives and just said, yo, I want to be friends with you guys, and I want to throw this crazy ass event on July 15th, and I don't give a f So, despite the rocky start, things are starting to pick up for the people. Their favorite content creators pulled up to support the event, the rappers were entertaining the audience even if it was in an unintentional way, and Fousey was posting how once 2 million people joined the live stream on YouTube, Drake would come onto the stage and the place would get lit. He was even telling people that if the seats weren't full by showtime that he would give every single person who replied to this tweet with a message a thousand bucks. All things considered, everything was heading in the right direction, and it would only be a couple more hours until Drake they lost power. Yeah. Guys, there's a power outage in the whole entire thing. Oh, These lights are still on though. Oh yeah, no, no, we're good though. I don't know what's going on. This is really creepy. All the power has went out in the whole building. Everyone's being evacuated. The parking lot just passed the box office. Keep moving down the road. You need to clear the road. Keep moving down the road. That was a bomb threat. It had to have been a bomb threat. That's why they evacuated. You were right. Yeah, it had to have been. If it ends this way, it can't end in a failure because it's not their failure, it's the bomb threat. Yep, someone called in a bomb threat as the party started to ramp up, and now a bunch of people were wandering about the parking lot trying to figure out what was going on and what to do next. The event was ruined both for those in attendance and those watching it online in the live stream. Drake wasn't able to perform, and most importantly, Fousey was nowhere to be seen during all this. People would wander about figuring out what to do next. We keep start even calling the man to find him and figure out what the next move is. We're in the back parking lot. Soon people would walk around the entire Greek theater premises to figure out exactly where Fousey was, and they would soon find themselves upon a very interesting sight in front of them. I don't know, but like as far as this goes, I hope we see Fousey right now. Oh, he's right there. Fousey. The YouTuber himself is actually on top of a car, uh. and he's been talking to a bunch of his fans down here. It's not a mistake. It was supposed to happen. Fousey was now ranting on top of his car about how the event was supposed to go, promising his Uber driver 50k and a brand new car for driving him around the city to the parking lot, and kind of just ranting onto the crowd below him. Keemstar would start asking questions about what was going on, and as time progressed, Fousey would get more and more unhinged, even stating he was off his medication, with people starting to realize that he might not be all there mentally and something was seriously wrong with the man. What was up with the rice gum diss track? I wanted to get to it, Kane. I'll have to explain it to you another time. You're not gonna do it now? I am. If you're gonna stay here, we're staying. And if my song came out at midnight, people were gonna think that it was a diss track towards Rice Gum and not understand the intention behind it, and it was gonna blow the whole event over. But it was a diss track on Rice Gum. There's a reason for it. I'm gonna get to it. Okay, dude. The video is the song is a straight up diss track. Like, you're saying that, Have like... Have you ever heard of irony? KSI and Deji acting strong! Oh, 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 not to let them use me! Oh, Tyler Perry put me in this movie! Hey! Given that he never answered Keemstar's question, he would again ask what was the point of dissing Ricegum, and that's when the real stuff starts to go down. I invested all my money into this event, and I did it for free. You're making a documentary on it, so you can post it after the fact. So if it flops, you can have the hot news on how Fousey f***ed up and he should kill himself. Or if it's a success. Or if it's a success, I become a good person. But why are you gonna profit on me being a good person? You're giving me attention because it's gonna put money in your pocket, honey. You're still talking about the little things. You're heating up your breakfast when I'm heating up my dinner. I have bipolar and depression. That what you put into my head made me want to kill myself! After this meltdown, Fousey would try to unsuccessfully explain how he met Drake, and then it would turn out that Drake never actually planned to attend the event at all, meaning that Fousey was lying to everyone when hyping it up. Things would eventually end with the police rolling in, and later that night they would officially get confirmation for why things went so south. Hate Dies, Love Arrives was a failure on a scale never seen before. From its very inception being only a week earlier, Fousey using every relevant celebrity's name to hype it up on Twitter, it was set up to be one of the greatest feats a YouTuber could ever achieve. People were hyped for the event, but what they instead got was a virtually empty venue with low tier music artists, a bomb threat forcing everyone to evacuate, and rather than being an event on a scale never seen before, they got a meltdown on a scale never seen before. Keemstar was in the midst of documenting all this on his channel and would upload the footage in parts, with the first two containing the epic buildup and utter failure. However, we still had the aftermath to look forward to, because now that the event failed and Fousey was clearly not all there mentally, people wanted to see what else they could get out from this guy. Soon after this giant disaster, Fousey would show up on the No Jumper podcast again just two days later on July 17th. 
However, this was unplanned, as the podcast was originally going to be between Adam and Shane Dawson talking about whatever was going on during that time, including the aforementioned event that Fousey ran. They would start to talk about him and speculate on his intentions and goals and whatnot like pretty much everyone else was during this time, only for the man of the hour to show up in the middle of their recording. I just want to Yo, watch. Yo, Shane, Shane, first of all, I love you. Thank when you. I reached out to you, um, it was with good intentions because I knew if there was somebody who was going to tell a real story, it was you. He would go on to say that Ticketmaster wanted to help him do another event due to the bomb threat ruining the night and tell Shane that he appreciates the way he goes about making his more serious content. Noticeably a lot more calm than he was a few nights before, albeit a still tad bit crazy sounding. All the stuff I've been wearing where kids look at, oh my God, he has Supreme, he has Gucci. I looked at a guy dead in the eye before things got crazy and told him I was going to give him this Rolex off my wrist. With that being said, the conversation was going pretty alright given the circumstances, as Fousey was mostly just trying to explain his intentions, saying that the rice gum diss track was more like baiting people to think it was a negative thing when there was supposed to be a deeper message, and then Keemstar would join the mix to make it a four man show now. Their conversation together would start off pretty well, with Fousey apologizing to Keemstar for lashing out at him that night, and then going on to say that his event wasn't actually a failure in his eyes. My lash out was internal anger that I had held in for years that just decided to come out there. And again, I apologize for that. But one thing I want to say, I'm going to say to you, I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to say to you and to the people of the internet, Hate Dies, Love Arrives did not flop. It was a great success. It didn't go in the way I intended it for it to happen, but it went in the way I needed it to happen. He would continue to go on about the event before Keemstar brings up the Drake situation, in which Fousey says that Drake never told him he needed 2 million views before he came up on stage, whereas on Twitter it was heavily implied he told Fousey that number, so things are starting to get a bit strange on the air. What's no, wrong there's, there's nothing wrong room? with saying that, but I feel like if Drake said that to you, he was basically saying, I'm not Drake coming. Drake didn't say that to me. Drake didn't say that to me. Now Fousey does get into the Drake story, where he goes on for the next 15 or so minutes trying to explain how he met Drake, which ends up with him not actually meeting him at all. I leave my house the day before, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so much energy surrounding us. Two, I believe in manifestation, right? So I say exactly what I want to happen and that's what gets it to happen. So I wanted, I started July 15th a week ago just by putting it on a shirt. And with that one idea and energy and manifestation, every single thing I put, is happening, but not in the way I wanted it to. I'm now standing by myself. The club is emptying out. The only people who are allowed to stay in the club is Drake's team. Guess who's standing with them? Me, because I decided not to give up because I had a mission that night, as crazy as it sounded. And literally, Adam, I'm this close to Drake. But instead of taking that moment to be like, Drake, can I get a picture? This is gonna prove all my haters wrong. I accepted that it already was done. As soon as Drake moves and makes eye contact with me and I stare at him, I see the, his second right hand man and he nods at me like this. I walk out with him, I go, what's next? He goes, brother, take my number, I'll tell you all the details tomorrow. I did it, I was hyped. So I you didn't it. meet Drake, he just looked at you. While things started off with Fousey seemingly getting somewhat back to normal, it became clear that he was still a bit out of it when telling the story about meeting Drake. The way he explained it made him sound like he forced himself into a club full of celebrities, hid himself and stayed behind with Drake's crew, and at that he didn't even meet the man, only seeing him up close instead. Shane Dawson's facial expressions made it pretty clear what he was thinking about the man sitting right next to him, and I'm sure that thousands of people watching this live had the same exact feeling. Fousey, while calmed down a bit from the days prior, was still on this wave of manifestation and positivity and whatnot, but to everyone around him they were questioning both him and his mental state still. Keemstar and Fousey would talk about the diss track and intentions for a good minute, the whole squad would pitch in, and then Shane would say his piece as he dipped out due to having other stuff scheduled that day. Fousey would go on to say that he hired the uber guy seen at the parking lot to be his own personal driver, clarified that the event had no financial incentive whatsoever and it was just for the people, and continued to kinda just ramble on about manifestation some more. Keem would eventually leave after getting the answers to the questions he had, and the podcast seemed to be winding down by this point. That is, until influencers Sam Pepper and Ice Poseidon joined in, and let's just say that Fousey still had some more to talk about. Sam would go on to tell Fousey he felt disrespected because he was making tweets that implied he might have been the reason the event went bad, and then gets into a story about how Fousey's men were lying about him at the event and they got him arrested for the bomb threat for no reason. Fousey would start to tell him that all he does is live his life through drama and that his negative energy is the reason that all this happened to him as the two of them start to go back and forth with each other. 
it's how you live your life as so a person. So you're saying because of my energy, it justifies the fact that one of your staff shouted, you li- the, told, lied to the police. You manifested it into for, your life. I manifested that one of your staff member <laughs> True. would Read lie the to secret. the police and commit a criminal offense Read by the confiding. Because you live your life that way every day. Go. How can you justify that? They would continue to argue with each other as Adam and I sit aside and let the cameras roll. And let's just say that if he thought Fuzi already had an ego, things were about to get to the next level. Yo, yo, you want to bring hate into this? Since you fell off of YouTube, how many movies have I been in? My mentor is Tyler Perry. I just crushed the world on July 15th. I bought my mama house, Sam. I bought myself a house. I bought myself a Ferrari. I bought myself a Range Rover. I've donated over $100,000 every single year to charity. Why have you ever called me a mean? You surround yourself with yes men. And And that's why I'm a leader and a champion dog you know, that's why i'm gonna become a, a world famous motivational you speaker you have money and you give people money and they say yes for you. yeah because yes, i help seriously. people i'm worried for you i'm just okay and i i'm worried for you and that's how i told you what i Look, felt about you to me and i still love you and i can stare at you and say i love you and the reason i'm doing this is because i want you to change bro you I stop being you. a walking l you stop being a meme start doing shit I for your life about hate why, Why the f- would you not want to just have your say and everyone in the world know, yes, Fuzzy Chew's Because right. I'm a real man and I don't need yes men on the internet to tell me who the f*** I am, you little this bitch. This is WWE guy. Put Thank the mic you, bro. Down. I don't agree with anything you do, anything you stand by, how you live your life. We are not the same. I'm a f- champion. No, no, You're beta yeah, as f- yeah. I'm an alpha. I'm a lion. You're, uh, you- <sighs> Oh, that, oh, that's Rawr. a yikes from me on that one. <laughs> he would soon leave after this tirade, but it became pretty clear to everyone watching that Fuzzy was still not only a bit out of his mind, he was also extremely egotistical in this state. Sam Pepper was one of the first big internet influencers to really call him out on his act, and Fuzzy immediately started to get angry and flex his money to show to Sam that he was beneath him instead of actually letting the man say his piece. His ego was at an all-time high, and anyone who showed a slight bit of criticism would immediately get belittled and reminded how they're negative or their energy is bad or they're not as rich as him. This was arguably a worse look than the event failing, because while one can make the argument that he was having a manic episode and not mentally all there, he seemed quite calm when joining the podcast up until Sam called him out on his act. Him and Adam would talk some more about him after he left, and Sam would give some insight on just how the man operates when trying to achieve a goal. I have willed myself to be the guest on The Ellen Show on Friday the 20th to introduce myself to the world as Yousef, and then his full name, which I can't pronounce, the motivational speaker. <laughs> so he's, it's the same with the Drake thing. Yeah. He's actually not on The Ellen Show. He's written, I have willed myself. So he's saying, I'm believing so hard that I'm going to be on The Ellen Show that I'm confident enough to write here that on Friday the 20th, I'm going to be on The Ellen Show. They would continue on with the conversation about how he's manic and egotistical, saying how despite that, it makes for extremely entertaining content on the internet. And then Sam would mention that if he ever got into live streaming, that it would be even better than what they have now. God, if he did live streaming, it'd be done. The rest of the stream is full of nothing important or anything you haven't seen already. But everyone watching was again reminded that Fuzzy was still not all there mentally, despite how calm it started off when he first joined. It seemed that he wasn't used to people going against his plans or viewpoint. And in fact, it seemed that a lot of people had the same idea going on inside their heads. They just don't want to say it out loud because they don't want to be rude or berated by the man. Keemstar would drop the final part of the documentary on July 21st and would get right into it as he had a couple more questions for the man of the hour. As Kim was asking about having Drake show up, Fuzi would interrupt and say he never said Drake would be there despite him clearly doing so, showing that he was still in denial and that this interview wasn't going to be a normal one. You already talked about having this event yeah. and p- potentially having Drake there. I didn't mention Drake's name. I mentioned the names of the artists I knew that I could get at that time. Drake happened when I got to LA and realized Drake is in LA. Keemstar would discuss with Fuzi about the what ifs involving Drake and if he showed up, with Fuzi adamant that it was the bomb threat that caused him to not go, and Keem saying that it was a bit out there given the circumstances. But what did I? in what ways did I do something wrong when the bomb threat stopped him from coming? Was it the bomb threat? Because yes. there wasn't that many people there, and I don't think Drake would have showed up with he like 1,500 have. people. And if he wouldn't have, he would have on the second one. They would discuss some more, and Fuzi would drop a promise to Keem and the people who are going to watch the documentary about a future goal of his. If I am not on that stage, I promise you to walk away from YouTube, my whole acting career, me do, wanting to do what I want to do in life, I'll live in isolation and no one will hear from me ever again. Fuzi would expand upon this talking about how he has crazy ideas for the future because he wants to achieve something in life. 
opens up about how his family and friends keep telling him he's going through something right now, and then says that once he got off his medications, it became easier for him to think again. And say, I'm getting off medications, y'all. Right when I get off the medication, it's like I'm thinking for the first time again. Right. He would go on to discuss his dream of becoming super rich so that he can give it back to the people around him and proceed to bring up a video he uploaded of a kid who passed away from cancer that came out during the fake prank situation from two years ago. And this is what he had to say. A kid dies from cancer, but you're so negative and toxic that you try to spin it to make it seem that I used him to protect my image. Shame on y'all. You should have been trying to help me. You should have told me sort of go fund me. You shouldn't have wasted your time trying to make me seem like a bad person. He would go on to manifest that he would end up on a song with the rapper J. Cole and open up on tour for him one day, and then hit up Keemstar's cameraman AJ asking him about his dream job. He would then say that he would basically carry him through Hollywood and pay him to be his personal documentarian in the future in a very long-winded but very interesting conversation. I allow it if he wants Yo, to do it. How much do you want me to pay you to be in this, uh, to help with this documentary? Ask for a million. <laughs> <laughs> Name your price. Keen isn't selling, telling you to set a limitation. You are. Why are you limiting yourself? Just Name your price. Hours. It's Where? a crisis is movie. Name your price. I'm gonna fund your entire movie. And I want nothing out of it. I'm going to change the world. Tonight you met Yusuf Sawa Arqdaq, the world's most famous and renowned and best-selling motivational speaker. I will be on the Ellen Show. I will be on stage with J. Cole. I will be having dinner with DJ Khaled. I will be in Diddy's house. I will do everything I said. I will throw an event called Hate Dies Love Arrives 2 and Drake will headline. I love you so much. And that's Fousey would go on to say that he doesn't care about money anymore because it never made him happy. Say that he has been producing his own documentary behind the scenes for the past two or so weeks. And then go on to say that he'd be setting up Hate Dies Love Arrives 2 at the Staples Center now that he has the help of an Arab investor. He goes, if you want the Greek theater, it's, I mean, if you want Stable Center, it's yours. Meaning even if I have to take my own money from him to fund my dream, people are gonna help me all because it failed. So this moment of failure, I had to accept. I told my crew, everyone's gonna call me crazy until I do it, because I've already done it. Hate dies, love arrives to at the Staples Center. The documentary will end off with Keem and his crew hanging out with Show Luciano as he wrapped his hit single and they all party together. The final part of the documentary had a lot of similar notes to the No Jumper podcast, albeit a lot more concise with proper editing and whatnot. It had already been six days since the failure of the event, and Fousey was still trying to convince himself it was a success somehow. The part where he was talking to AJ was interesting because not only did he sound crazy for wanting to throw a bunch of money at someone he just met, it reinforced to everyone that he was still in a manic state. The moment Keemstar decided to see how it would be if he agreed with Fousey, he immediately started to use Keem's word to reinforce his message, yet he just told AJ to ignore the guy not even a minute prior. You can't look at the at the finish line and then go back and say, Don't you know, he had a dream. He's already here. I'm gonna sign a copy for my book to him. He just doesn't get the law of attraction. He doesn't get why I'm why I am so successful. You, you know, gotta believe, dream. Know. Wait, he's saying the right thing. That stood out because it reinforces the idea that Fousey surrounds himself with yes men, and as we saw before, when Sam Pepper called him out for this, he ended up with Fousey raging in his face in an attempt to intimidate and silence him for daring to speak the truth. Hate Dies Love Arrives was a massive failure on a scale never seen before in the YouTube realm, and even to this very day nothing has been able to replicate it, let alone top it. Everything surrounding it from its very inception to eventual downfall was entertaining, but not in the way that Fousey wanted, as instead of people enjoying the musical acts or being around him, they were more interested in seeing the continual downfall of his mental state. While one can argue a lot of people are taking advantage of a clearly sick man during this time period, it did make for great content, as people are still talking about it even over 5 years later. If Manic Fousey were to hear that today, I'm willing to bet he would still say the event was a success because it got people talking, so hey, maybe he was onto something after all. Fousey would go somewhat quiet for a bit after Hate Dies Love Arrives, posting a couple images on Instagram at a fan meetup in early August for example. He wasn't uploading on any of his channels at this time either. However, that would change on September 15th as his girlfriend at the time would upload a video relaying a message he told her to read, which was that he was going to handpick certain videos to promote on his 10 million subscriber YouTube channel. 
Some of you would send your music, some would send your incredible edits, some would express their interest in becoming an actor or actress, and some just needed someone to talk to. And for that reason, FoozyTube is being handed to each and every single one of you. All you had to do is submit your information in a little form on his website and wait to be chosen, making it super easy for the people to join. His next upload after that announcement would be one of the people he chose named Obey My Humor, which was a simple little skit on how to sneak into a college party. He was pretty happy being the first person chosen on Fuzi's channel as he uploaded a thank you video on his own channel for the help in hitting the 4k subscriber mark, so it seemed like Fuzi was doing a good thing for the people, right? Well, it turns out there was a catch for those wanting their video on his channel, as any and all ad revenue made off of it would go straight to Fuzi instead of the person who created the content itself. Basically, they were getting paid in exposure for their hard work while Fuzi took his break from the internet and got paid for it. Suddenly, it became clear this was not only a way for him to exploit his fans for easy money, it was to keep his channel afloat now that he was taking a serious break for an indefinite amount of time, all while hiding it under the guise of being such a good person and giving back to his fan base. Interestingly enough, one of the first fan videos uploaded on the channel featured the Uber driver he bought the car for and his son, with them showing it off as they thank him for what he did. Fussy, so thank you so much, Fussy. I'm happy right now, so uh, thank you. like you. it? Oh, yeah. Fresh, clean. Yeah. Oh yeah. See yeah. it's black on black. My dad is pretty much old school. Can I get the car wrapped? He likes to be while this is nice at a first glance, given Fuzi has this constant habit of offering people gifts or money in large quantities, this came off as not only him trying to buy someone's adoration for him, but also trying to convince the public he's a good person, when in actuality that's up for debate. Mind you, he's the one who messed up the guy's car in the first place, so to use this video in such a way didn't come off genuine at all, but more so as a way to advertise his supposed generosity to his fans. He seems to like to use his money as a bartering chip whenever faced with adversity. And while it wasn't as clear back then, now knowing how he operates, it makes a lot more sense. Fuzi was also away for social media by this time, and it seemed like he was going to be off for a good while by the looks of it. However, on New Year's Eve 2018, he would post a message on his Instagram admitting that he went through a massive manic episode that completely ruined his public reputation due to the way he was acting. He says that he lost everything he worked for in the past decade due to all of this, and that he has been seeking help through therapy and countless medications in order to help him get back on track, telling everyone he's grateful 2018 is finally over and that hopefully 2019 will be much better. For most of 2019, he would post every now and then on social media, though he was mainly staying away from the internet entirely for his own sake. However, on July 31st, he would appear in the Challenger Games, an event set up by YouTuber Logan Paul where influencers participated in track and field related sports. And here we go. And fast out the gate, looks like Logan. Oh, we have a tumbler. As we look at that, oh, looks yeah, like yeah. right out the block. And Fousey takes a dive there with him. He would then upload a video just four days later on his channel, poking fun at himself for promising to rent out the Staples Center for Hate Dies Love Arrives 2. But it's all good. I got Drake inside right now. I got Jake Paul. I got Kendrick Lamar. I got Meek Mill. I got everybody in the game inside. Welcome to Fousey 2 2019. Hello? The rest of the video would just be him at a boxing gym working out and preparing for a future fight. Oh yeah, Fuzi was signed by boxing company Winfinity to fight YouTuber Slim Albert in September, and for the next few weeks he would upload a bunch of videos training in the gym and getting back in shape for the fight. A couple weeks would go by and the fight would go down on September 29th in England, and this is how it went. Then I've seen on Yusef's face. Absolutely. There we go. Oh, he's straight in there! Yeah, he's an angry man. Yeah, this, this is not going to last very long, ladies and gentlemen. They are trying to kill each other out here. What a right hand from Fousey! Ah, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Defend yourself, Fousey. Defend yourself. He's just refusing to look well, after himself. You know, he's, he's not got much to beat, I must admit. Yeah. Because, you know, you know... Fousey's powers in, powers in, powers in. Fousey's a beaten man. Yeah, Fousey would lose by TKO, though he did show up and put on a show even if it didn't go his way. So at least he had that going for him. He would go silent on the channel for a few weeks after this, only to drop a documentary about the fight on October 13th. The documentary is mostly just repurposed footage of him training in the fight itself, with some new footage of him in the locker room talking to his team after the loss. Fousey would go quiet again as he healed from the fight, but then would get right back to it by starting his brand new series YouTube Cribs in November that year, first taking a look at Logan Paul's house on the inaugural episode. It's like a warehouse. 
Yeah, man. And it's just another room into the house. Fact. Was this built or was this here? Yo, I put everything in this house. This had proved to be a massive success as he finally got past the 1 million view mark for the first time in a long time. And so he would obviously follow this up with a handful of more episodes, with those getting great views as well. He would end up getting no surgery due to the past fight on January 15th, 2020, and would get right back to work on his new series. However, he would stop uploading after posting his Alex Wasabi episode on February 16th, 2020, going silent on the channel once again. It's safe to assume that this time was because of the fact the series involved him flying around to people's homes, and given 2020 had severe issues when it came to booking a flight and traveling around the world, he probably decided to just chill out alongside everyone else during that rather eventful year. December 2020 would roll around and Fuzi would get back to uploading on the channel. However, instead of getting even a decent amount of views, he would only manage to pull just under 100k despite it being two and a half years since his meltdown, meaning that people were starting to lose interest in the man. Nonetheless, he continued on with this newfound energy, uploading a handful of videos from him when he was visiting Africa, with those getting very low views as well save for that one clickbait video on the middle left there. In fact, he would only upload two videos after this, with the music video being posted on New Year's Day 2021, before of course, going silent once again on the channel like we've become accustomed to seeing by now. However, this actually wasn't a break this time, as he was instead getting ready to launch the first episode of his brand new podcast Gotta Get It with his host Aaron and JP, uploading the first episode on January 4th, 2021. The smart thing would have been to do, to go buy, I could have bought like a $6 million house. Instead, <laughs> I paid 13500 a month to live by myself in 1600 Vine and isolate myself in my apartment. The only neighbor he had was us. We were the only neighbor. Not true. Oh, and Logan. Logan Paul I mean, and Jake Paul, before oh, yeah. they were YouTubers, lived right next door. I the door next about to that. them. The podcast itself would do okay during its run on the site, with the final episode coming out on May 31st that year and not being worked upon since then. However, there was one episode worth noting, and that was the one where they go over the July 15th incident, in which we hear Fousey giving people some brand new insight on his mental state during that time and how things went down. One, I was in a manic state. I had gotten off of my mood stabilizer and my antidepressant and I replaced it with Adderall and I was taking Adderall multiple Ooh. times a day. Oh. Mixed with the high energy that I was involved in trying to throw an event in one week, um, the calamity of it was just too much to handle. I feel like there was a different entity inside me that was controlling me greater than myself. Not a, not a good spirit either. I think something evil. But what I felt honestly was that I was gonna achieve something greater than I've ever accomplished in my life. So the intentions were based out of ego, but that's just how I felt. Seeing Fousey admit that this event was based off his own ego on top of his manic state wasn't exactly shocking to hear as it was pretty obvious, but seeing the man himself admit to it on the podcast showed that he was in a much more stable place now three years later. Now there was an instance on May 12th that year where Fousey and influencers Bryce Hall, Taylor Holder, and others were invited to a party only for him to punch someone in the face. But given they were actually being harassed the whole time by the party goers like people taking their hats and such, this was within reason and he wasn't going crazy or anything again. On June 12th, Fousey and Keemstar would actually work together for the first time in three years at the YouTubers vs TikTokers Battle of the Platforms boxing match, where they would be billed as ringside reporters for the duration, with Fousey even being the fight announcer as well. He's not training five times oh, a day. Five times a day? Five a times day. a day. A day. A day. He's not Things are now about to heat up. Representing Team TikTok in the blue corner, Vinny Hacker. Now something that was unexpected was that for the first time in almost five years, Fuzzy would upload a video on his Dosa Fuzzy channel where rapper Blueface punched him in the stomach. The comment section would include a link to his brand new channel simply titled Fousey, in which the full video in question has been deleted since then. In fact, the channel seems to be mostly wiped out entirely, as only two videos remain on it, one being a music video and the other being another episode of his YouTube crib series, reuniting with Keemstar once more after the boxing event. While the video starts off in Keemstar's house, showing off his bar and massive backyard for the viewers to enjoy, most of it took place in the nearby woods as the two of them went off-roading with the camera crew. They would hang around for the next few days, and then on the day before the third year anniversary since Hate Dies Love arrives, they would announce that they have a press conference to attend as King cracks jokes about it. 
the three year anniversary because at midnight it's going to be and we don't hate, talk about that day hate dies love arrives stop talking about that day <laughs> yo we're going to see drake no it turns out this entire video is to make the official announcement of happy punch promotions a promotional company they co-founded together that focused on bringing more internet influencer boxing matches to the public for people to enjoy so basically what me and Keem are here to do is to give life and new light to the boxing and social media scene. So we are launching our own promotional company called Happy Punch Promotion. Woo! The remainder of the video will be them hanging around fans for the rest of the day at the location they rented out as they share their excitement for the future. It's also worth pointing out that around this time, Fousey had this re-up crew site, which was basically like a personal Patreon of sorts. Though it seems the last upload was just a few weeks after the Happy Punch announcement, so it seems he either got busy or forgot about it entirely. On September 28th, Fousey would release his book, Warning, This Is Not A Motivational Story, a 400-page autobiography of sorts that delves deep into his career and struggles, basically giving people much more deeper insight on how the man operates. On December 3rd, he would appear in an episode of The Reality House by YouTubers Kian and JC, in which a clearly drunk Fousey would start to harass one of the female contestants, being sent away to relax only for him and Bryce Hall to get into it, causing them to both get kicked off the show. She's a strong woman. We'll watch it. When I take your money, we'll watch it. Oh, we're talking about money. Okay, we're talking about money. What so, else am I talking about? What the f I care about? Money. Yeah. You want to talk about money? Yeah. So you're trying to save each other? No. You, you, all no. your money's gone. Oh, no. Why are you no touching the girl, bro? Hey, 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 that hey. money Why are Listen, you right here? Lucy, you can't, you can't, you can't put your hands, you? don't do that. I sincerely apologize for even coming close to your face. Oh. I thought You we didn't were... just come close, you like face pumped her. Like, don't. Oh, thanks, Rice. Bro, none of, none of us are lying to you. Ever. None of us lying so, to you. So, touching a woman's head is lying. Touching. Is 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 touching. They would announce in the video that Fousey had alcohol issues but has since started to get help for it, so even though the situation was a bit messed up, it wasn't anything close to what he's done in the past, and he was getting help for the current issue he had going on. Fousey wouldn't be seen on YouTube for a long period of time once again, but that would change on May 13th, 2022, as he would upload a new video on Dose of Fousey announcing his comeback now that he's gotten a hold of himself again. He would upload a handful of more videos to the channel, but the views are noticeably bad, like really bad, especially for his standards. He was barely pulling around 40k on average, and given the channel has over 3 million subscribers, this was beyond a bad look for him. He would stop uploading to the channel again on May 28th, just two weeks into reviving it, and given he didn't seem to have any mental or physical issues going on at this time, it seemed that he might have figured out the channel just isn't worth the effort anymore. Fousey would then take his efforts to his main channel, as on June 22nd he would upload for the first time in a year and a half, reuniting with his former collaborator Roman Atwood. He was already getting back to his ways as on July 10th, he would announce that he was going to fight YouTuber Deji hosted by sports streaming company Dazen on August 27th. This time he wouldn't post any videos on his workout progress on either channel, but on August 24th he would upload another trailer to hype people up some more. The fight would go down three days later for the world to see, and this is how it went for him. Dolby when they spawn. That's right. Fuzzy hits home. Deji coming straight ahead. Oh, big oh, one. Nice from Deji. Deji putting on pressure right away. Got him again. Got him again. Oh, wow. This is Deji's all over him here. And Fuzzy's in a bit of trouble. For all, he's great at running. No, oh. He set it down with a jab. Oh. Straight left, right between the guards. We got a bloody nose now for Fuzzy. Oh, and he caught is he standing in the pocket, still throwing. And they're gonna throw the top is in! Deji's won! Soon after his second loss, Fuzio uploaded part one of his documentary on his journey leading up to the fight on September 4th. It's nothing exactly groundbreaking or stuff we haven't seen before, and while Fuzi was indeed in the gym working out and such, it had this vibe that felt like the documentary was the main focus rather than the sport itself. This was a lot more apparent when part two was released on September 19th, as most of it was full of not very important footage, such as going out to eat with his trainers and the multiple press conferences within the week of the fight. It still had those egotistical notes going on, but given this is boxing, that kind of stuff is normal and is in fact encouraged to a certain degree, so while it felt a little off, it wasn't anything necessarily bad or out of the ordinary in that realm. 
Also, despite being labeled as part two or three, part three would never be released. So whatever that entailed will most likely never be seen by the public. This four year breakdown since the July 15th incident was very interesting to see. It was clear that Fousey was back on his meds and possibly even more, as there were no hints of him being manic or crazy anymore. Sure, he was still a bit egotistical and his personality was still a bit grating, but he was overall doing a lot better for himself even if he was losing the boxing matches he was a part of. The main thing that came from this period was his channels were really suffering, as while he was able to somewhat revive his main FouseyTube channel with the YouTube Crib series, nothing else was pulling in the massive views he used to get. Dosa Fuzi was more or less dead, and it became pretty clear that most of his fanbase moved on after the July 15th incident. Fuzi also decided to keep busy during these off times by working with Keemstar and generally getting back into his favorite pastime of working out heavily. So by all means, even if a lot of people disliked him now, he was doing good for himself personally. Even though he had a scare in his Discord server in December later that year, he was overall healthy, and while his YouTube success was far gone now, his life was getting back to normal and he seemed to finally get himself around this hard point in his life. He would even start posting on Dosa Fuzi again on May 18th, 2023, mainly of himself getting back in shape, showing everyone that even though he might have fallen off on the internet, he was willing to work both his career and himself back up. He would continue to upload to the channel even if his views were bad, showing that even though he fell off, he was going to do what made him happy and content with his life. On June 17th, Fuzi would upload a video titled The Honest Truth, in which he does a full workout while opening up about some very personal things about himself. I'm saying I want a family, a woman to grow with, a woman to build with, a woman to come home to, a woman to, you know, take pre-workout with, post-workout with, cook with. I want children. I'm at the age where I want that, but my personal life is at such a place where I'm so far from that. It's like, it's frustrating. And the hardest pill to swallow, especially in my case, is knowing that you had all the opportunities in the entire world to have those friends and nurture those friendships and get those relationships and meet those women. Like that past life that I've lived that the entire internet saw, I had all those chances, but I wasn't tuned to it. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't know what I had while I had it and I mistreated it until the point where I lost it and then realized, oh man, you messed up. What's notable about this video is you can actually get a hint of him being honest. And given how he usually is, that was something that was very, very rare to see. It seemed he was finally able to accept and tell the internet and what's left of his viewers that he understands how badly he messed up throughout his time online and understands that he now has to live with it. For the first time possibly ever on the internet, it seemed that Fuzi was finally becoming content with himself. It had been five years since he ruined his reputation and dreams of Hollywood stardom, and while he went through the motions no doubt, he found solace in his favorite pastime while also working with Keemstar in a brand new business venture and life opportunity. While he surely still has his haters and understandably so, it was nice to see him finally find some peace in his life and keep things going steady. Well, he certainly found peace alright, but as we know by now, he was bound to lose it sooner or later, because if there's one thing we know about this man, Fousey has a knack for always ending up in a negative media spotlight in one way or another. In July 2023, Fousey would start to stream on Twitch, promising to stream his entire life 24-7 in an attempt to gain a new fanbase as quickly as he could. This would catch the attention of many people online, including Ethan Klein of the H3H3 podcast, who would invite him onto his show on July 19th to talk about his current situation and to see if he's going through another manic episode or if he's just excited about this new venture he's going on. They would talk about his blow up on YouTube and how he and all the other big prank channels at the time were faking everything. And then when mentioning the July 15th incident, he would stand his ground and say that Drake was supposed to show up that day. We talk about July 15th on here, I'm gonna stand on my 10 toes and say Drake was gonna be there. Right now? Right now. Drake, you are in touch with Drake. You're still saying that. I'm, st I'm still sticking to the story. I found the guy who I ran into in the club that night who gave me his verbal agreement that he would be there. He would go on to tell that insane story about how he went through the club and met a bunch of people leading up to Drake. And again goes into how he only saw Drake rather than actually meet him. Also giving some more detail on his mindset leading up to that very day. Next thing you know, Drake is walking out the club. He's walking towards me. Never looks at me, never anything, but he says goodbye to Joel Embiid right in front of me. As he leans in, his nose is like right here, my nose is right here. I don't stand and I don't ruin the opportunity to be like, Drake, Drake. In my mind, if I text you a picture that I'm about to publicly promote and say Drake is gonna be there, if he's not gonna be there, you're gonna tell me, stop it right now, cease and desist, what are you doing? You can't do this, da da da. Next thing you know, the bomb threat gets called in, and you know the rest of the story. And then obviously, but Drake was never coming. 
I believe he was. Bro, I stop. I personally, I swear to you, I personally think Drake was gonna be Okay, Fousey so would then go on to talk about his mental health, going on to state that after the incident where Bryce Hall knocked him out, he was at a rehab center and he discovered he actually wasn't bipolar the whole time. I get sent to a rehab in Karen, Pennsylvania, and they do a 30 day intense eval mm. with many therapists daily, everything. And at the end, they gave me my diagnosis and they said, Yusuf, you have no signs of bipolar. You're severely depressed. You suffer from depression, but no signs of bipolar. They would continue to talk about mental health stuff, talking about each other's issues in detail for the viewers to understand. Though mostly just diving into Fousey and his mindset after certain events in his life, like the Deji fight, for example. He would go on to talk about a lot of very personal stuff in semi-graphic detail revolving around his manhood and how he had issues with it growing up throughout his life. Before talking about Keemstar and that despite their tumultuous past, he still believes he's a good person. But I want to say Keem treats me really good and he really cares for me. He does. Yeah, until you say something just a little bit off and then he tries to ruin your life. I, I really I, I really don't think like even me talking about this on the podcast, I don't think he's going to. No, I don't think so. You're not saying anything yeah. wrong about him. They will continue to talk about miscellaneous stuff we already know about and more stuff about the Bryce Hall incident. But given we know about it already, it's not the most important for us, but it was still interesting for people first learning about Fousey on that podcast. Fousey would then get into the bomb threat that happened on July 15th and speculate on who might have been the person to call it in. Two hours before the event, I'm still in the hotel waiting. I get a call. I get a DM from Sam Pepper. Sam Pepper? Sam Pepper. And he says, yo, Fousey, everybody was talking about the event. Yo, Fousey, can I come to your event? Of course, brother, because we were beefing. Of course, brother, this event is called Hate Dies, Love Arrives. I'd love to have you. Sam Pepper's live streaming. Put two and two together. How you think maybe happened? it was one of his audience? 100%. I think so. He would then go on to talk about his journey taking ayahuasca in the jungles of Peru. And this is what he had to say about it. This is real Peruvian ayahuasca in the jungle with real life shamans. This shit was dark. I got uh -oh. told by the guy, by next Wednesday, you're going to start feeling better. You have to rid yourself of all the toxic in your life and all the toxic you've acquired over the years to be able to accept the good. You know what he told me? What? When it wasn't working and I was finally ready to go home, he said, Yusuf, I think you should stay here for six months to a year. You really <laughs> need it. You feel like they're scammers? No. It helped everybody else that was there. Everybody else left with the biggest smiles. I love life. that was wrong advice for you. Yeah. The rest of the stream would consist of them talking about stuff like electric cars, Fousey learning to be better with his money, and the man himself of course thanking everybody for letting him onto the podcast and for being so kind to him. Now as far as that 24-7 Twitch stream was going, it was going pretty good for the man. Even if some of it was unintentionally funny, like with an accidental slip up in his language and rapping along to a J. Cole song on August 1st. This was clearly an accident and nothing more. And ironically enough, this mistake helped get a lot more people looking at the man again. This new live streaming venture was looking to be an interesting opportunity for Fousey, as while he hadn't had any out of character outbursts just yet, he was still entertaining people in the new realm of content creation for him. He even started uploading to his main YouTube channel again that very day, and while it's obvious that his views are bad, his streaming career was his main focus now, and as we've seen so far, it was going well. Of course, you already know this wouldn't last for long, and in fact, controversy would happen rather quickly into this venture of his. On August 6th, Fousey would meet a woman at an airport and start chatting with her, in which she would clarify early on in their conversation that she wasn't sober. My chat is wondering, are you drunk at 8am? No, dude. Yeah. You're sober? Yeah, well, okay, no. Cool. <laughs> What'd you drink? You know what I mean? <laughs> What'd you drink? I just had a Bloody Mary. They would continue to talk with Fousey very obviously flirting with her, and even getting her to kiss him on multiple occasions as well. He would even joke about how his audience was going to cancel him for kissing her so much in a jestful tone during the initial encounter with her. They're going to cancel me for this. <laughs> I don't care though. After all this miscellaneous flirting, she would go in to tell him that she was a victim of sex trafficking back when she was younger, with Fousey responding as such after hearing her story. Um, so I got, sell I got sold into the sex trafficking. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing. I appreciate yeah. you being this honest. This is a real conversation. No, it's real. It happens, My audience it might everything. not understand, but I've been there. Mm -hmm. I used to be a sex addict, so I used prostitutes I for years. Um, I used I massage parlors for years, yeah. so I understand. Yeah, so I'm I, glad yeah. you're free from it now, though. He would offer to pay to get a tattoo of her pimp's name removed off her, and then go on to send money to her cash app to help her out alongside that. Fousey would send out her cash app for his fans to donate as well, 
and he would begin to comfort her as she started to cry due to the support she was getting after they heard about her story. They would continue to open up to each other and eventually head off camera as Fuzi said he was going to buy her snacks for her trip, and for the next 10 or so minutes the stream would just be the camera pointing at the very bar they were hanging out at. However, Fuzi would come back and turn the camera around, and this was the very first thing he had to say. I just joined the Mile High Club. And I know it doesn't count as the Mile High Club because I was in the airport, but I still joined it. I swear to God, I swear on everything I love. I swear on everything I love. I just joined the Mile High Club in the airport, in the men's bathroom. I swear to God, voila. Well, I had to confess, I couldn't hold it for a second. I didn't go to buy her no snacks. I joined the Mile High Club. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have shared that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm lying. I'm lying. By the way, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a huge joke. It's a huge joke. It's a huge joke. I'm typing. I'm sorry in chat. It's a huge joke. It's a huge joke. You got pranked. You got pranked by Fousey too. You got pranked by Fousey too. His immediate 180 after realizing what he just admitted to everyone was interesting, as it showed he was well aware of the ramifications for what he just did, and it would only get worse from that point onwards. I gave her a choice. I said, you want to come to the men's bathroom or the women's bathroom? She said men's, so it was her option. She came into the men's. Ha ha! You guys got pranked. Ha 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 You guys got got. No, that's not cool. No, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I, that was f***ed up of me to do as like, this is a prank and everything. She did not do anything. She's a woman of two. She loves her children. So please respect that. Fousey wasn't even honest with her when she came back and asked what happened. But then her response would immediately give away that he was trying to lie to his audience again. And that they did indeed do the action together. But no, no, no. I, I played an actual bad prank on you and I apologize. What, what was it? I told them that... Nah, no, I don't even, no, 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 I don't even want to explain it. I don't even want to, can I get a Diet Coke? <laughs> I said, yeah, guys, we joined the Mile High Club. No, it's a prank. I said, guys, we joined the Mile High Club. I'm sorry. We joined like that, like 200 feet, huh? Hmm? 200 feet, I'll take that. Are we good? Yeah. I'm sorry, I sure am. No. I'm trying, no, no, no. She would eventually leave to catch her flight. And he would start to immediately defend himself saying he could have done much worse but did it because he's such a nice guy. I didn't try to take her, like literally, I could have done so much with this girl. I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm saying that to mean her vulnerability was crossed against the wall. If I had wanted to, I could have done anything I wanted to with this girl. He would start to break down in chat realizing just how badly he messed up. And that would eventually turn into breaking down on stream as his viewers started to turn on him. I'm not a good person. I swear to God, I fooled all of you for thinking I'm a good person. <laughs> I used to go to my school. <laughs> but the girl was sex trafficked, man, and I feel guilty about that. Because I used to mess with girls who were sex trafficked. And the fact that she was one of them makes me feel like absolute shit, dog. And no one's gonna understand that, but I understand that. It's guilty. He would then tweet that he's starting to lose it again, and that he'll be calling his therapist once he lands to help get him back to square one and not to go insane again. Fuzi would end up apologizing and uploading a video of it on his channel, basically going over the story again now that it was starting to hit major internet circles. The video isn't anything new or stuff we haven't talked about already, and it was pretty obvious this was an attempt to save face after taking advantage of a vulnerable woman for his own pleasure. He was heading right back down the same familiar path he's been on before, only this time with a new route leading to that familiar territory. The very next day after the incident happened, Fuzi would get banned on Twitch for using vulgar language, but given what went down the day prior, there's speculation if that was the true reason or not. Fuzi would then take a short break from streaming because of this, but those close to him were starting to comment what was going on, such as his business partner and friend Keemstar ranting about how he's had so many chances to better himself, and that he only seems to say he's having mental health issues and facing controversy among some unsubstantiated claims about him. He was then directly mention the man three days later on the 10th, telling him that he needs to get back into contact with his advisors before he spirals out of control again. 
Fuzu would reply saying he has a lot of people on his side watching him and for nobody to worry as it's all under control, and Keemstar would reluctantly hope for the best in his reply to him. Fuzu would then promote his upcoming appearance on Bradley Martin's Raw Talk podcast talking about his time at Happy Punch, with Keemstar saying that he's just happy Fuzu's promoting his team helping him out behind the scenes. The podcast would be a two hour talk in total, in which Fuzu would have a lot of say about his time running Happy Punch alongside Keemstar. They would talk a bit about his past, and then Fuzu would mention again that he isn't bipolar but was just misdiagnosed instead. Like, well, actually, I'm not. So I was misdiagnosed as bipolar. I so talked you, about that. You actually have something. Now. I have severe depression. I have OCD. I have anxiety. They would talk about how he lost all the money he got back in his prime, but has accountants now that control it for him. That the new generation of streamers are starting to hang out with him during this newfound resurgence. Go on about how he's grown from his past and seems to be moving forward in a positive direction. And finally answers one of the most asked questions throughout his career. Or are you like gay now or something? Like what's going on? People think so. Are you a little gay? So I'll say this. <laughs> that, was, yeah, that wasn't a no, dude. I'm straight. Okay, okay. I only like women. They would start to talk about the airport incident for a bit and then get into how Keemstar messaged him soon after and he said he never did nothing to her, only for him to start posting about it on Twitter. Keemstar. Keemstar, right? Text me immediately. Bro, what the f How could you f up? My girlfriend's giving me hella shit for it. He wasn't even mad. His girlfriend was mad and he's whipped by his girlfriend. So he goes, my girlfriend's giving me shit for it. I reply to him. First thing I say is, Keem, I did not f this woman. He goes to Twitter, bashes me. Goes on drama alert, bashes me. Fuzzy would keep talking about how Keemstar is one of the main people who went at him back in the day when he was exposed for faking pranks. Go on about how the new generation is smarter than him because they're a lot more calculated with how they go about their internet careers. Speculate about his upcoming deal on the streaming site Kick, and mainly just go on about money for a good while. The interview so far was pretty tame overall, but then it would start to get interesting for people watching. Fuzi would bring up Happy Punch and go into a story about how after he lost the Deji fight he was struggling a bit with his body due to the surgery and other personal stuff in his life, and that he and Keemstar had to fire their social media guy after a massive mistake he made in which Keemstar would start to berate Fuzi for taking a year off and being lazy. So now Keem goes, Yusuf, I need you to be Dana Tube. What do you mean you need me to be Dana Tube? I don't want to be on the internet no more. I'm depressed. I'm going through shit. No, I've been working on this business the entire time that you've been training and didn't say a single shit. You were busy for a year before that. You haven't done shit for this company. I need you to be Dana Tube. But I'm scared of shit of Keem. So I'm like, I have to. Fuzi would go on to spill some more info about his time at Happy Punch now he's not happy working with Keemstar, including a story about how Happy Punch had money issues behind the scenes. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you. The reason Happy Punch went to shit, me and Keem were supposed to make money from all the purses. There was a problem. John, Keemstar's manager, who owns uh, everything with Keemstar, wasn't working with me, so he was unhappy. Why should I do everything for Happy Punch when I'm only getting 20%? Well, you're only getting 20% because you don't even manage me. You manage Keem and I'm still giving you 20% of Happy Punch. That should be more than enough for you to work. No, I need more. So I get a lawyer involved. The lawyer talks to them and he goes, well, guys, sorry to break it to you. We can't, you guys can't get paid anyway. Promotion, promotional managers can't be managers as well. Promoters can't be managers. So what is John and Keem's solution? Because they're making money 360 from everything else anyway. All right, fine. We won't take any percentage from the fighters. We just want them to rep Happy Punch and be Happy Punch fighters, and we'll do it that way. But I signed Dean the Great. Like, that's my guy. How am I not going to receive money from Dean? I want to manage his career. Sorry, Yusuf, we can't. So the money, I had zero income that I was supposed to be making from each fighter. They're getting paid 200000 100000 for each fight. Yeah. Saw zero of it. That's what f***ed up Happy Punch. Fuzi would eventually get back to work despite all his personal issues going on, but eventually leave the company due to all the stress, almost getting to his breaking point again before being helped once more. And even though he left the company, Keem was still trying to hit him up alongside other stuff. Verbatim on the phone, he would say, I need Dana 2 back. Nobody can do what you do. You're the best in the game. When he kicked me out of Happy Punch and gave me the 5%, he said, the reason I have to kick you out is because I have to invest the money we're going to make into somebody who's going to do your job. Till this day, this happened in 2022, he never hired a single person to do online content, and he only has the same person who's doing Instagram. All I asked him before I got kicked out was, Keem, just keep me as percentage owner. Let me work behind the scenes like you. Let me do these events. Let me be the person who takes care of the fighters, like Dean the Great, who looks at me as an but older you brother. Are, you, are, you are as a percentage owner. But guess what he said? Hmm. 
I already do all that behind the scenes. I don't need you. I need you to be Dana Tube. Mm. So I left. He would go on to claim that Keem took his girlfriend's side when the airport incident happened and that's why he's currently unhappy with him. And the conversation would wane off from that point onwards. Fousey and his assistant and girlfriend Kitty will start to bicker between another about an incident that happened the other night. And while not the most important thing in the world, it was still an interesting situation going on, albeit on a much smaller scale. Be a man, carry your own bag here and there. That's what happened with the, with the Tesla incident. I get that, but had you asked me, hey, Yusuf, get your bag, I would have known. I didn't know it was my responsibility, truly. I walked down before you, but he, he, carrying everything in the bag. I yeah, had all you your bag. I had all his. Said, Hold on, I gotta Look. go up. To he would go on to talk about how Tristan Tate messaged him before. Talk about how Jake Paul helped him in his personal life just this past year. All three of them would talk about how they wish they did some things better in the past with their current internet careers and lives in general, and things that end off with Fousey saying that he plans to start streaming on Kick once the deal is finalized. Keemstar wouldn't take lightly to what Fousey had to say about him and Happy Punch, so he would take to Twitter and talk about the airport incident and clarify his side of the story first. The reason why I texted you and I was upset is because when the thing happened with you and the girl in the airport, all right, I woke up early that morning, I call you, and I say, Fousey, what's going on? I got all these messages from YouTubers that, you know, something bad's happened, what's happening? And you go, no, I'm fine, I'm playing the July 15th character. He goes, Keem, I just fucked this girl in the bathroom. And I'm thinking, right on, good for you, man, good for you. Later in the day, I get the context of what actually took place. So I text you, yo, what is this? Even my girlfriend's mad, this is such a bad look. And you text me back, I didn't that girl. Well, you just lied to me then. Cause I, I called you early that morning, did you forget? Did you forget I called you at 10.30 Eastern that morning and you, you told me on the phone? He would then get into the happy punch situation that he brought up on the podcast to clarify things that went down on his side of this life, and this is what he had to say about it. The part that you left out is when you did get better, you came back, we got on the phone, we started talking again daily, we were working on, you know, I was calling you every day to get you back, and I asked you, are you upset about buying the shares in happy punch, all right? And you said, uh, yeah, it kind of bothers me. I'm like, okay, well then just buy them back for the same amount. You, you left that part of the story out. And that didn't happen once. I offered you to buy back your shares at the same amount that uh, you sold them to me at least 10 times in our conversations. I was trying to figure out anything to help my friend and help my business partner get back because you were so down. He would then tweet out the phone call he had with Fousey back when he was under the impression he just scored rather than manipulated the woman at the airport. Also quoting what he allegedly said to him in that short call they had together. Fousey would then reply to that video leaking their DMs showing that Keemstar was saying that he was using the girl from the very beginning, basically calling him a liar about his story of initially not thinking it was a big deal. Keemstar would respond with the screenshot again, this time directly at the man himself, and then Fousey would drop a video response aimed at his former business partner, doubling down and saying how their very first text showed Keemstar berating him. The only reason all these fake news articles are posting that I got banned on Twitch because of sexually assaulting a girl is because drama alerts spread that fake narrative. But do not try to say I called you and say I fucked this girl. That's low, Keem, even coming from you. I love you. I love Happy Punch. Have a good life, brother. I'm setting a boundary between us now. He would also try to imply that he texted him first saying he didn't do nothing, only then admitting on call that he did do the girl, trying to hint that the text might have come first. If you notice, the leaked texts have no date attached to them, and the call between Keemstar and Fousey happened at 11am that day. Fousey was in a New York airport during this incident, and Keemstar lives in New York, meaning that they were both on the same time zone during that short call together. Fousey would drop a screenshot showing the exact time the messages are sent, that being at 2.12pm while trying to imply that they took place before the 11.14am phone call. However, he was now back in LA in the Pacific time zone which is 3 hours behind Eastern, meaning that they actually took place at 5.12pm Eastern and he was trying to use a coincidental time frame to try and frame the messages in a false light. This would be confirmed by Keemstar himself as he would reply showing the messages from his point of view and that they were sent at 5.12pm Eastern, meaning that Fousey got those messages at 2.12pm Pacific instead of 11.12am Pacific like he was trying to imply. That means about 6 hours after their call, Keemstar messaged Fousey that he just learned the real context and that his girlfriend is going off about the news, meaning that Fousey got caught red-handed lying and trying to twist things once again. Keemstar responded to these lies in a new video on Twitter, saying his story once again and exposing Fousey showing that he's still lying and manipulating the people. So when I text you later to confront you once I know the context, 
You straight up say, Keem, I didn't do anything with that girl, but you forgot that I had a call with you earlier that day. You can see the timestamps. The evidence is in your phone. So if you're not gonna be honest about the phone call happening before the text, which you can prove to yourself by just looking at your phone, then you, bro, you. Fuzi would start to call Keemstar an emotional abuser, and so he'd respond as such on Twitter, with Fuzi continuing to perpetuate that narrative while saying that he and his fans don't like him no more. Keemstar would respond by posting a clip from his live stream of Fuzi's therapist admitting that the last time he did anything was at the airport, again showing how much Fuzi was trying to lie and manipulate people saying he didn't do anything. Oh, you know a friend of mine tried to say today that I wasn't sober? It was so hurtful. You, you, you've been sober until that uh, thing in the airport, I know that. Right? Love you, Susie. Yeah, I love you. Bye. I'll see you Monday. Bye. Keem would then get banned from his Twitch stream entirely if Fuzi admitted it just a few minutes later on Twitter. And then he would show that Fuzi also blocked him on the site and speculate that it was most likely after he posted a video of his therapist. Or it could also be because of a Twitter space they were in together where they argued with one another about their story and their personal issues for the world to see. Tell everybody I bought the house for myself. If I take accountability, own your shit, team. You've never apologized first to of me. All, first, ever. Of all, first of all, you're bringing up so much old shit that I don't even Yeah, because it's unrealed trauma, team. You made me want to kill myself. Oh, you're not oh a good God. person. Keem said we're going about how Fuzi never wanted to do any actual work and implied that he was using his mental health issues as an excuse for being lazy. How despite what's going on between the two of them, he's concerned for Fuzi and his mental health ever since he started live streaming. And Fuzi would continue to lie and say he never did anything with the woman in the airport. I swear to God on my dead grandpa and my dead dog that I am this woman. Okay, but calm do down for a second. Before drama alert goes and post that shit. He would go on to accuse Keemstar of being the sole reason he wanted to end it all. And he's done the same kind of stuff with other people before. And then go on to imply that his hit single Dollar in the Woods was a reference to the burial of his dog Dollar. You made one song called Dollar in the Woods. And first of all, my dog that died that I buried in the woods was named Dollar. So go f yourself first off. <laughs> Second what? off. What? Wait, what? 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 You, you've hit me with some crazy accusations. But that right there, that is the fucking, that is the, that's the one that's in outer space. was my was, was my dog named dollar so you you mean you actually think that dollar in the woods is about your dog do you really believe that Kim and Fuzi would start to argue over who asked who to record the July 15th documentary Keemstar would tell him to take accountability for himself Fuzi would claim that Keemstar has never said sorry for what he did to him some more arguing about how working for Keemstar made Fuzi unhappy and about when Fuzi left Happy Punch and now Keemstar was the main guy running the company now that he bailed on him. Because I don't have time to do anything. All I have is to do is this. I'm yeah. running this shit by myself. And I started off with a promise from you that you didn't keep. You were supposed to be my partner. You were supposed to grind. We were supposed to do this together. And yes, it was your idea but you left me to run the shit all by myself you left me you promised me i'm gonna be here then then you didn't come you promised me i'm gonna do this and then you didn't do that you have promised so much shit that you were gonna do so many different times for weeks and months and years to the point where i got so frustrated that the only way happy punch was going to exist is if i bought out your shares and even in that moment i didn't buy out all of them i made sure that you kept five percent because it was your idea i was a good guy i was a good guy to you in this scenario and you have twisted it and manipulated it into be some evil Shit. Fuzi would start to say that his new promotional company G7 Promotions will outpace Happy Punch and basically beat Keem at his own game. They would continue to argue about the airport incident, and things would end off with Keemstar saying that he believes Fuzi is manic once again. I'm not really that mad because I think he's sick. I think he's manic. I seen this in July 15th. I don't think he's well right now. Like that's 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 what I think is going on. Now there was a lot of back and forth with plenty of allegations and speculation to be about. But truth be told, it's really hard to believe Fuzi given he's a known liar. We saw him trying to twist Keemstar's text messages, and we saw him trying to lie about the airport incident until his therapist outed it to everybody. Everything that Fuzi says is to be taken with a huge grain of salt, because he's shown throughout his entire career on the internet that he's willing to lie in order to get to the top. The next morning, he would get banned on Twitch again for an unknown reason, only for Fuzi to show that it was for dangerous or distracted driving under the self-destructive behavior section on Twitch's guidelines. People would search for the reason why, 
and it was most likely because of his realistic rendition of the hit song Stand by rapper Eminem. I'm in the car right now. I'm gonna remind you on the freeway. Hey, slip. I drink a fifth of vodka. You tell me to drive. Need some stuff and more. And then she'll die too. Well, gotta go. I'm almost at the bridge now. Oh shit, I forgot. How am I supposed to send this shit out? Fousey would then start to stream on Kick on August 11th now that his time on Twitch was over. But almost immediately it was clear he was still spiraling, as he was admitting on stream that he was off his meds and acting very erratic, such as scolding and eventually firing part of his security team for not babying him despite his job being only to keep him safe and nothing more. And what have you provided for me of that today? Have you given me a Diet Coke? No. no. Have you given me a Red Bull, sugar free? You haven't. Have you given me water? Yeah. Once, twice, the same bottle, four times. Dog, if you want to be with me and work for me, protect me like a multi-million dollar brand. I promised you something, you decided to work for me, that's your fault, you're getting paid for this. I didn't give you a deal, I didn't give you a contract, I don't know you shit. I said course. this to you many times, I fired three employees in the last week. I did not look back, I did not say sorry, I did not apologize. I kept it moving. Actually, you guys can go home now, hey. You guys can go home now. I'm gonna call Nadim. He would even go on to threaten to fire his manager Nadim, someone who invested heavily into his streaming career and a figure known within his circles, for not being able to keep up with his everyday life, and eventually get kicked out of his Airbnb for harassment. Bro, I haven't been on my mental health medication in 48 hours. Guess why? Nadim. I don't know Nadim like that. But hey, and you know what I did? Right when I fired him, I called my accountants and I said, hey, pay him back his 60,000, add 40,000 on top, wire it to him. She said, okay, Yusuf, you think I give a f about his 60,000? He believed in me. That don't mean I have to hire him and let him ruin my life because he sucks at his job. Yo. Yo, we got kicked out? Yeah, I already sent you all tell them. What was the reasoning? Uh, because of the, every, they're harassing everyone that they're watching and they're not, they don't feel comfortable with you there. Okay. 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 Tell them to suck my dick. Tell them to suck my dick. Are they on my own cameras right now? Yeah. Hey, suck my dick. I paid your house nothing but respect. Suck my dick. He actually threatened to fire Nadim hours earlier that day, but hadn't gone through with it yet. So it was very clear he was acting out once again. Despite his ego being at levels people never thought would be possible, it was clear that once he got some good money he was back on his old attitude, and that attitude was one that was bound to sooner or later lead him to more trouble in his life. On August 14th, he would get into a heated argument with Kitty, with her calling him emotionally abusive and him going off on her while the people watched. You just looked at me in the eyes in front of my business my and said that I'm emotionally valid. abusing you, but... You said I'm emotionally abusing you in front of my business and then you call me manipulative because you're not fishing right now. I'm you're not right. gaslighting right now to get everybody to be like, oh my God, Fousey emotionally manipulated. If there's one article that comes out now that says Fousey uh, emotionally does this to his assistant, I will never look at you in the eyes ever again. Delete my phone number, block me from Kit, block me from Twitch. After this argument, he would then go on to mock her later on with setting up his shower that night. Yeah, guys, I was emotionally abused. He flew me to Vegas. And he was mad that I partied with Tiger and Nadia instead of him. He was mad that I didn't even hang out with him one time. He was mad that I didn't help him with shit the whole weekend. Guys, cancel him. Have fun with those views. Can't cancel him. It was clear that he was manic again, and while last time it was only the July 15th incident and that being the only day for people to hinge on, this time it was an entire 24-7 livestream showing each and every moment for the world to see. Fousey would have his moments on stream, such as acting funny around random people and running into traffic, and overall just being a very entertaining menace to those around him. Yo Nadim, fire everybody. I want a new editing team. Actually, the editors didn't text me. They're fine. Fire everybody. Everybody. If they're on payroll, fire them. They don't get a two week notice. They don't get a severance package. They don't get a recommendation to any other businesses or anything. They can go f themselves. She called me a psychopath. Do you believe I have security now? He was hot as f Yeah, he has a beard, bald, he looks like me, he has tattoos. Fuck! Oh. Like, like me 
being that's with a another man. Of, huh? Like being with another version. That's like the straight version of me. It's hot as. But it's somebody's joke. The scene yell left it all from dirt poor in the trailer. I'm on the Miami freeway, by the way. Watch out, watch out. Whoa, whoa. His eccentric attitude now that he was off his meds while worrisome to see was certainly keeping people's attention as he would keep ramping things up, such as freaking out in the deep end of a swimming pool and burning a jersey in the middle of the street. His streams are certainly very entertaining, but trolls will start to intervene, such as sending pizzas to the gym he was working out at, and even calling a bomb threat at a restaurant he was eating at, causing him to get kicked out. This trolling will continue on, but this is something that a lot of streamers have to deal with and is unfortunately commonplace in their line of work, so while debilitating, it was something he was going to have to start getting used to. Now as you've seen, Fuzi has both the entertaining side of himself, and the side that just berates and bullies anyone he deems below him. This bullying was mostly seen whenever the streamer Neon was around, as he was clearly a young teenager at the time that Fuzi kept pressing because he can't stand up for himself. Granted, Neon is annoying and runs his mouth a lot behind the screen, but it was getting to the point where Fuzi would simply press him for the sake of not liking him. I'm gonna beat Neon's ass today. I'm gonna take all my energy out on Neon. He's the only person I can actually beat up in life. He doesn't, listen, you're 35, get a grip of your life, man, holy. Hey, 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 hey. She's not dying. You are. Please try. I need security, oh god. I actually need security, don't troll shit, bro. While well, entertaining in its own way, some people didn't like how Fuzi kept bullying the one person who was clearly weaker than him physically, using his strength to intimidate him and whatnot, and add that alongside a line about the airport situation, they started to root against the man and hope for his downfall soon. Fuzi's arrogant and egotistical attitude would eventually hit its peak on August 22nd, as that day was a cascade of events that nobody not in a million years could have predicted to go down. Fuzi would start the day off bullying Neon at the place they were staying at, slapping him again and throwing food right at his face, bragging about his upcoming kick deal as it hadn't been finalized yet. I swear to God on my life, I am signing you a kick. I'm gonna be number one on kick, dunking over Aiden. If you keep this shit up, Allahi, you're never gonna be on my streams ever again, Allahi. Fuzi would go on a rant a bit and eventually kick him out of the house, call streamer Aiden Ross and rant some more about Neon and his behavior, but then he would let him back into the place to hear him apologize. After some vague threats and more arguing between the two of them, forcing food into his mouth to assert dominance, Neon would eventually apologize to Fuzi for whatever he did to him and they'd move on with their day. Later that day, Fuzi would go meet the twin duo of the Island Boys and start talking to them about them kissing each other on their OnlyFans, before YouTuber Jack Doherty would chime in and call Fuzi a beta, in which they would start to go at each other before getting kicked out of his house. Hey, now we can't box! There's a whole- oh, 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 I slapped the dog shit out of you. I slapped the dog shit out of you. Hey, my dick is hard. My dick is hard. Your is walking. Where things get interesting is that a troll and a kick streamer named Gonval had been keeping up with Fuzi, and this guy wasn't like most trolls, as he was known for harassing former music star Aaron Carter up until his passing in November 2022. In fact, the day before the 21st, Fuzi wound up dealing with him when hanging around with Aiden as he managed to get the phone numbers of some of his family members and start to harass them. I'm not capping y'all, some kick streamer um, was calling my mom and harassing her and calling my brothers and saying like crazy shit live on kick. This would cause Fuzi to have a small breakdown as he doesn't want his family to be involved in any of this stuff, but seeing him cry and stream got Gunval even more interested. After the Jack Doherty incident, Fuzi would get back to his hotel room for the night, and sometime between the last two days, Gonval would end up getting banned on kick for doxing as they became aware of him. It was too late, however, as one of Gonval's Discord members was able to get the room number of the hotel and gave it to him, in which he would start to harass Fuzi one-on-one -on -one over the phone. You know we have your address? Oh, really? Oh, you like doxing too? Hey, I know where you are right now, and I live here, buddy. You think you're gonna make it the rest of the night? Fuzi would start to rant in his hotel room that he's gonna get him arrested for harassing him, tell Nadim to contact the police as soon as possible, but Gonval will call once again and harass Fuzi some more for the world to see. Where do you wanna meet? Where do you wanna meet? Where do you wanna meet? Hey, what's your address? Text me your address. I swear to God you're dying and I will lie you're dying. Florida, pull the f up. Watch, Florida, this is stand your ground, buddy. You threatened to kill me. I have it recorded. Watch what happens when you come here. This would cause Fuzi to get understandably paranoid, so he would call the police himself to report the incident. He would get frustrated with the operator on the phone, yelling at them and saying a bunch of stuff that wasn't true in his fit of manic rage, before going on to brag about how important he is to them. 
I'm in the inter continental. Oh, give me the phone, man. Give me the phone. You gotta calm down. Bro. No, dog. Sit down and calm down. Relax. I'm gonna. Oh, because back. a guy told me I'm gonna relax. die tonight. You want me to relax? Yo, sit down. And let me give her the address. She's trying to get the address. Relax. I'm a, I'm a public figure. I'm the most viral man on the internet right now. I got invited to go to Andrew Tate's team. I'm like that guy right now. I'm a live streamer. My life is on stream 24-7. I travel around the country and promote sobriety to everyone. I just signed a $77 million deal to do live streaming. He would go and explain the situation to her while still bragging about his net worth, start to argue some more as she was trying to clarify the exact details of what was going on, and then eventually just lose it once again. Send the cops! There's a gun to my head right now. There's a gun to my head. Help, ma'am, 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 he left. Ma'am, he left. There's a gun to my head. Help, help, get them. Help, bye. Ma'am, Intercontinental, what's my room number? Help, tell me. 2027. That's what I have to do to get help? Nadim would call him and they would start to argue as he thought Fuzi was going off the rails again. Fuzi would say the only reason he hasn't fired him yet was because his father said not to. Then rant a bit more as he and his security guard prepare for the police response. And this is how it went. And you, you guys don't even seem like you're serious about this. Are you guys going to do anything? We're recording. That's what I'm recording. You guys are just standing there doing nothing with your hands out. This is Miami Dade police. Yo, what are you talking about? I'm being serious. My life's in you're, danger and you're sitting here staring at me. Why does nobody work hard in this world? Come out. Why am I the only one? You're out? You're not going to protect me? You're on camera. What is it? I have his address! What is his address? I said grab my security 20 minutes ago! You guys are dumb as f man. You guys are literally dumb as f Oh, yeah. Hey, record this. Security! Come in here now! They told me to stay outside. I can't come inside. Yo, for my protection, come in here! I can't come inside. They told me he to can't come in? I cannot. Y'all are... I'm suing all y'all. My life is in danger and you arrest a Palestinian Muslim who's viral? Are y'all dumb or are you stupid? Do you like your job? You're... Hey! Yo, relax. Hey, free Fusi! Hashtag free Fusi! Early the next morning, TMZ was able to confirm that Fusi wasn't arrested, but rather taken to a hospital for a mental health evaluation given how the situation was going. Five days later on the 28th, Fusi would release a video from a mental health institution to give people an update on how he was doing. Um, can't leave the hospital until I get clearance from the police, so I've been here for four days now. They drug me up every day. Anytime I say something wrong, wallahi, they put a needle this big into my arm. But I love y'all. I made the .4 second shot. I got fouled out. That's all it is. I'll be back. Y'all know that. Season 2 on the way. We champions now. Let's get it. G7, baby. Given that Fousey was officially off the internet again, people weren't expecting to see anything new from him on any of his pages. But a video would get uploaded on September 15th, basically compiling a bunch of highlights throughout his career in the recent downfall, basically trying to hype up chapter 2 of the G7 stuff he has going on. The comments can be summed up pretty easily right here, as everyone has accepted that he's unhinged and crazy at this point, and that they're just here for the show. On September 20th, the police body cam footage will end up being posted online showing it from their point of view, like how a security guard came all the way down to the lobby to explain the situation to them as they headed up to the room. I think he's a little off a little bit. You guys want to still talk to him? Yes, no, he's by himself. He's by himself. That's why I came to meet you guys first. No one else is in there. Who's your client? His name's Yusuf. He, he's, he's a big YouTube streamer, big kick streamer. He's like, yeah, so he's the one that called. He's the one that called you guys. Yes. They would talk about how he's off his meds and how they plan on handling the situation. His guard would call Nadim so he can talk with the police to provide more context, and eventually the arrest would happen. They would escort him throughout the hallway to the elevator, and Fuzi would start to speak some mess to some of the cops. Yeah, but you guys are you guys just up in front of 70, I swear to God, on my mother's life. I'm a good person, I'm a civilian, We're not I'm sober, We're not I'm changing that. the world. I have more eyes on me than the president has on this country. The kids are listening to me. Andrew Tate invited me to Romania. I'm a, I'm a chosen messenger. Y'all just arrested me. You don't know what you just did. Like I said, you're not my life was in danger. You're going to get big right, dude. You're what? Mental. You're going to get big right then. You're going to mental facility, okay? Why? Because you're not there. As his guard was talking outside the room with the cops as they had questions for him, Fuzi would continue to berate the cops as he led him to the car, and he would go on to say some pretty suspect stuff. Nothing that can hurt me? No. I got a big penis. It could hurt you a lot. I'm gay. Nine inches. Is that on body cam? I'll f you so good till you love me. The cops would talk amongst each other, Fuzi would talk some more about Andrew Tate and how the cops are getting fired, 
and the footage will end off with some more berating from the man of the hour. Which one of you want to touch me? I bet it's you. I bet it's you. You are going to touch me. Look at that. Uh, uh, don't let your dick get hard. You arrested the wrong dude, dog. I'm worth seventy-seven million dollars. It don't matter. You put arrested on me. Evaluation. You arrested me. You didn't believe me. You walked out of the room. I have it on video. Seventy thousand people yeah, saw it. Mine's recording too. They're already reporting you, dog. Good. To your officer. Hey, fire this. I'm suing his ass. Yusuf Erkat is one of the most interesting people to ever grace the internet, let alone YouTube. His initial story being some random college student who just wanted to entertain people slowly turned into one about a mentally deranged man who was willing to lie and cheat his way to the top. He eventually lost his fame, money, and pretty much everything because of him and his choices alone. And after a couple of years of on and off work, he would make his comeback and somehow manage to get even worse than before. This roller coaster of ups and downs has been entertaining to watch, but the cost on the man himself has been drastic to say the least. As far as what the future holds for him, Aiden Ross are going to say that Kit co-founder Eddie is trying to salvage his deal and that they're trying to get him right back onto the site once he's out of the mental hospital. He will be back. And he plans to come back to streaming straight into it, bro. Um, and uh, we're going to get on that kick deal for sure, locked in on paper uh, recently. Is he, Eddie, Eddie wants to be all part of making sure he recovers the best way possible, supporting him in everything, uh, making sure that he comes back with whatever he, whatever he wants. Now, it's pretty obvious this isn't to support Fousey's mental health or anything like that. It's because he brought in a bucket load of views and money to the site and they want him back as soon as possible to keep that train moving. So yes, while extremely scummy to use a clearly mentally unwell man for monetary gain, that's business for you. Kick wants to get their numbers and money up, and while I certainly understand wanting to bring it back from the business perspective, it's just really disheartening to think about. There will be periodic updates on Fousey's Twitter account during his time in the hospital, such as his team posting his workout regime to keep him sane, and even his mother visiting him during his stay all while people waited on his return. They would start to tease it on October 21st, stating that his treatment was coming to an end and that he wanted to share his mindset during the moment, and then would reply to a Bradley Martin tweet teasing his comeback and that it'll be very soon. This would prove to be true as on November 5th, Fousey would make his return to the internet during an Aiden Ross stream, showing off his new look during his two and a half month stay at the mental hospital. They would talk a bit about Neon and what he's been up to, Aiden would get Fousey to sign his kick deal but he would say he wants to take it to a lawyer first, and Aiden will hook up Fousey with 100k after he told him he was broke since he got out of the hospital. I have, I have $20,000 left in my bank account. Okay. I know about your financial troubles. Nadim was telling me about it. That's Nadim, right? Yeah. Okay, I never met you, so I don't know. You have nice eyes, by the way. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, Am I about to get one of those like Aiden Ross surprises that he does to me? I, uh, I'm going to give you, it's not a loan. You don't have to pay me back. I'm giving uh, you $100,000. 100 He's since gotten back to using social media since the live stream and has even shaved his beard, almost like a symbolic way of starting fresh once again. The Fousey cycle is officially back at the beginning, and given what we've seen throughout the past decade, it's more than likely he'll go through another mental break within the next three years. As clearly mentally ill as this man is, he doesn't want to stay off the internet, and he's surrounded himself with a bunch of enablers who feel that attention-seeking behavior, whether it be for financial reasons, online attention, or a little bit of both. It's such a peculiar situation, because one side of me wishes that Fousey stayed in the mental institution for much longer, but the other side of me is intrigued now that he's out because his online escapades are interesting to keep up with. It's such an entertaining mess to watch his life unfold on stream, but I also know that seeing a mentally ill man ruin his life is wrong and the people around him are just using him for content, and as unfortunate as that is, that's the reality to the type of content he decided to shift to. A lot of these people around him definitely care on a surface level about his mental health, but when you're a content creator, you don't want to stop the man who's bringing in the views, because less entertainment equals less views which equal less money, and after all, we all know why these people make content in the first place. Fousey is also not a good person, and while it was debatable during the lying pranks in July 15th sagas, it's not debatable anymore after this streaming one. He has this need to remind everyone around him that he's the alpha dog and that they're below him, and anytime someone tries to step up to him, he immediately tries to shut him down in any way he can, whether it be insulting and bullying them, or in some cases, using physical intimidation to scare him into submission. He ain't a weak person, mind you. He's pretty strong and could definitely put up a fight against the average guy, and he knows this because he was constantly trying to use his strength to intimidate people during his live streams. In fact, the only times in his life we don't see him act this way is when he's medicated, showing just how much help this man needs and that he needs to surround himself with better people in his life. 
Fuzi will most likely go on to say that he was off his meds and that's why he was acting so crazy and ask for forgiveness again. And while that's definitely true, people can excuse this man over and over and over and over again like they always do. He's a threat to both himself and the people around him, and given he's shown that he's willing to go off his medication on a whim on multiple occasions now, he's also ironically becoming predictably unpredictable. He's not even bipolar anymore, as it turned out his doctor misdiagnosed him, so using that excuse to explain his actions has been thrown out the window. There's no proper way to end this story because, well, it's not over yet. Fuzi will get back to steadily using the internet sooner or later, preach about how he's changed and on his medications again, only to slowly start spiraling once more and possibly end up in a worse situation than the August 22nd incident. It's entertaining for all the wrong reasons, and unless someone in his life provides some actual guidance on how to go about the world with his severe mental issues, things will end well for him. With that being said, one thing's for sure, he definitely achieved his goal in entertaining the masses, albeit not in the way he originally intended way back when dropping that very first video on his channel that fateful day.